Most people have practiced being an employee for so long that they don't know how to be a CEO or they find it very hard to function as a CEO. Today's learning session is all about how to use the skills that you've learned as an employee and how to be an effective CEO so that you can run a successful business. Hi guys, my name is Dee Williams and today you're going to go from employee to CEO. Are you ready to get started? Wow, okay, y'all know I got a scream in there. <laughs> All right, so during today's agenda, we'll be covering the following four topics to prepare for part two of this series. Are you truly ready to be a CEO? Are you ready to drink a cup of that FOD fuel? The CEO mindset formula, and then we're gonna talk about some CEO basics, okay? Now, are you ready to be a CEO? Are you truly ready to be a CEO is the big question. Now, many people think that they're ready to be a CEO or that even they like they want to be a CEO, but they really don't understand what's involved in running a business versus working for someone else. And that's really, really one of the most important things that you want to understand, you know, when thinking about starting a business or when running a business either. You know, there is this glory and glitter and recognition and all of those things that are involved with being a CEO. And that's awesome. That's amazing. But those CEOs carry a certain characteristic. They they carry certain characteristic characteristic traits. Right. That allow them to be able to accomplish the glory, the recognition and all of those things. Most people in the world today are truly not equipped with those characteristics. They're not ready to be able to be a CEO. But today I want to talk a little bit about those characteristics, what they are and why they're important and why they're an important part of being a CEO. So let's talk about it. I mean, and I want to start by posing one simple question. And that question is, are you a realist or are you an idealist? Okay. Are you a realist or are you an idealist? Now, there is a poll that I just launched. All right. And I want you to vote and I want you to tell me would you consider yourself to be a realist or an idealist? Now, some of you are probably wondering, D, what's the difference? OK, so a realist, right, the definition of a realist, they accept the situation as it is and, and they're prepared to deal with it accordingly. OK, they have a firm grip on reality. They can see things for what they are right now. How many of you walk around telling your friends and your colleagues, listen, I don't know about you, but I'm a realist. I see things the way it is. Right. Um, they accept and deal with things as they are. That's the bottom line. When I went through my run through with Lyric, I said, are you a realist or are you a idealist? She said, I'm 100% a realist. I see things like, this is what it is, mama. <laughs> don't try to tell me so it's something different. I don't even want to hear it. Whatever you see in front of, whatever I see in front of me is what it is. She's a realist, okay? Now, an idealist is a person who is guided more by ideals, right, than practical considerations. Someone whose plans or goals are lofty, they're grand, and sometimes even unrealistic, right? Um, they are, uh, uh, an idealist is someone who follows their, his or her ideals to the point of impracticality. They're visionary, they're dreamer. All right, I'm looking at these numbers. These numbers have changed so much. Please vote right now. Where do you fall on the spectrum? Are you a realist or are you an idealist? Now that you know the true definition, where do you fall? The numbers are moving, 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 moving. Woo! I love it, I love it. Put your answers in. Let me get some music going on while you're getting your answers in. Uh, let's see, I always gotta have <laughs> some good music. Dun, 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 
Put your boat in. Put your boat in. Oh, yeah. Woo! Okay, we are here. The numbers are in. It's still rolling in. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Put a one in the box when you answer. Put a two in the box when you have it. And I'm going to read some of the comments. I'm actually going to open the lines tonight because this is a learning course. Okay. This is a learning course, all right? Ooh, it looks like we have our final numbers. I see lots of ones. I see lots of ones. People are still logging in. That is amazing. Wow, so honored, so humbled. All right, all right, I think we have the numbers in. Okay, here we go. So the results are in and the numbers read, there is on this call 40 percent of the professionals that are on this call consider themselves to be realists <laughs> realist, go realist, go realist. all right and 60 percent of the professionals on this call consider themselves to be an idealist <laughs> go idealist go idealist hey brandy okay so let me open the lines to someone who wants to talk, hey, Ronaldo, and tell me why you believe you are a realist. And you cannot say that you're both because you, your strength is in one area, either more times than never you keep it real or more times than never you're dreaming. So Tanisha, no cheating. <laughs> okay. So anybody want to get on the line, just say me. Don't be shy because we want to learn. All right. So I went to an event over the weekend and I came in kind of late and I um, I sat down and I started to, to speak my truth or my opinion. And at the end of the event, everybody came up to me and said, I'm so glad you said some of the things you said, because it really got me thinking. This is why I love being in things like this, because people are sharing their thoughts and it allows us to expand and grow. So I want to give that back to you. I uh, would love to open the lines. Who was a realist and why? Come on, tell me who. If you don't tell me, I'm just going to open your line. So you got to share. <laughs> Thank you, Tanisha. She's always the brave one that just comes to my rescue. I love it. This is why I love you so much. Thank you, girl. All right. Tanisha, talk to us. <laughs> Tanisha, no, I'm not driving. This is Tanisha Daniels. I'm here. Ah, thank you. Hey, my sweet love. How are you today? I'm fine. But you know what? I do have my little grandbaby in my lap. She's staring at me. <laughs> so, hey, so, so I, hope she, I hope she doesn't get lost. So she does. I'm sorry. No um, worries. Um, I would have to say, you know, D, I did say that I'm both. But OK, if I have to choose, I would definitely say that I'm a realist because um, I'm pretty much black and white. With me, there's no gray area. So that's okay. why I would say that, that I'm a realist. That's your real. Okay, perfect. I appreciate, you know, I think a lot of us have that black and white in us. I can see why you would say I'm a little bit of both because I know there's also, I know you well enough to know that there's also a, a big piece of you that is also a visionary, right? You also, yes. you know, are an idealist as well. But I, I, I would have to agree that I think the core of you is like, uh-uh, I'm checking this. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, uh d so that's pretty cool i appreciate you participating Mwah! thank you so much thank you d all right anyone else any more idealists want to step up and talk about why they feel that they i'm sorry realist why they feel that they are a realist and why they have this realist mentality anybody anybody want to come out and talk about being an idealist aisha you said something about being an idealist. AJ, you said something about being an idealist. Tell me a little bit about that. Why do you feel like you're an idealist? Let me see if I can get, let me see if I can get AJ on the line. Oh, his line is out. Let me see. What about my, I will, okay, AJ, let me open your line. Hold on. It says your audio pin, you've got to enable your audio pin. So as soon as you do that, I'm going to open the lines for you because I would love to hear what you have to say. Also, Yemi says she's an idealist. So while we're waiting for AJ, let's get Yemi on so she can actually speak on it and talk about it. 
That's important. Hey, hey, Yemi, you got to turn your mic on. <laughs> turn your mic on, my love. Yes, I want to hear from the idealist and the realist. Who are you? Let the world know. Woo! Let me see. Everybody, okay, so AJ, you're, you've are you got to log in. And Yemi, you are open. Angela says she's a realist. Let me see if I can get Angela on here as well. Hey, Angela. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much for asking. Tell me a little bit about your realist mentality. <laughs> um. Well, I like things with like facts and figures. Mm -hmm. um, I also like to look at people's behavior mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I kind of judge things off of how thing, how I see things right now. Okay. Like um, in the past, I've worked for companies and, you know, people have had high hopes of things changing mm -hmm. and I've kind of saw a pattern of how mm -hmm. things have been in the past and I've always you know, tried to keep it real <laughs> in terms of where I saw things going in the future. Mm -hmm. So I understand that. I appreciate it. I can relate to that a thousand percent being a boss <laughs> and having a staff, you know, they come into that interview and they're like, oh, they're fire. Right. You know, they're about to go in and do some serious stuff. And then three months later, <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what happened? Oh my gosh. So I totally get that. Thank you for so much for participating. You're so amazing. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> AJ said, D, I am ready. AJ, are you a realist or an idealist? Hey, D. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm more so idealist uh, because I always try to, uh, you know, look at the realistic perspective and then always try for changing and making it better and keep looking for how, you know, ways to, to improve. Um, I, I look at the reality, but I don't accept as is because I always try to make it better. So that's yeah. why I would say like, you know, I'm, I'm constantly looking for future. Like, how can I make this better? How can I make this better? Um, so I'm, I'm more so towards the idealist. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I don't ignore the reality. I am also, you know, agreeing with the fact that I'm also like black and white. Like I, I understand, you know, that respect as well, because under unless and until you don't understand the reality, you can't change it. Right. So, I love that. so first, my first step is to accept and understand the current situation, and then always strive for for changing it. That's what I'm talking about. I I have to admit, I I am an idealist too. Probably eighty percent idealist, <laughs> which I don't know if that's good. Yeah. AJ. <laughs> Yes, you can, really you can never be 100% idealist because if you're 100% idealist, that means you're totally ignoring the, the reality. Uh, exactly. And that means you're living in a dreamy land and that's, that shouldn't be the case. That is, that's exactly right. I will tell you my thoughts, not my training's thoughts of hardcore, but I'll tell you my thoughts about being an idealist and a realist in a minute. Thank you so much for participating. I really love you so much. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right, that was AJ. I said, I love you. He's like, uh huh. <laughs> so cute. Okay, Goldie, are you there? Hey, can you hey. hear me? Yes, how are you, my love? I'm doing fantastic. What about yourself? I'm phenomenal. Are you an idealist or a realist today? I am 100% idealist. Okay, um, talk about it. I, I believe in law of attraction and I also like write vision boards. Mm -hmm. So um, even though I drive this car, but on my vision board, I have a Mercedes Benz yeah. and I, I don't I don't look at my now situation as like what I am living in. I'm like if it's cold outside, I'm like, oh, it's in my head. I'm like, no, I'm on the beach. Yeah. I'm, it's, <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> I hear seagulls. <laughs> yes. Yes. You are already pre manifesting the next yes. phase in your life. Yes, yeah, correct. yeah, I, I went and I love the fact that you you carried that proudly, you know, that says a lot about your knowing and your your level of faith. So I think that's awesome. Thank and you. Uh, I'm a lot like you, to be honest with you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> be vegetarian. Oh, hello. <laughs> and Tanisha, she said, that's a great way to look at things, Goldie. 
And it really, I think it really is. I mean, I think there's all a place for being a realist. Like AJ said, it's also definitely a place for being an idealist. And, um, and again, I'll give my personal opinions later, not yet. But I love the fact that everyone is participating and they're starting to think about where they they lie on the scale. Thank you so much, Goldie. I really am are we gonna, not a problem. Stay near your mic because I, I feel like you got a lot to say. That's right, girl. Unmute me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. I even I hear somebody says um, idealist for me. They say I'm a realist at work and an idealist when it comes to my life outside of work and where I envision myself. Someone says, my husband is an idealist to the core, and he has opened my eyes some to the idealist side. You have two, D. I love you. Um, someone else said, knowing that where I, I am currently isn't. That's important, right? So very interesting. So let me, let's talk about this a little bit more, all right? So, ooh, ooh, ooh. Let's talk about what it means in relation, what an idealist or a realist means in relation to being an employee versus a CEO. All right. So let's look at this. Don't get mad, though, because <laughs> I got a lot to say about this. OK, so first of all, a realist is an executor. Right. A realist is an executor. And most realists tend to carry an employee nature or role. Why? The big question is, well, because they see things as they are. They see what's in front of them as truth. And then they move on their visual. You know, they move based on their visual truth. Right. They're also great at making ish happen. These dynamic individuals are typically very task oriented. They're very action oriented. They're more than comfortable with processes and systems. They're almost obsessed with them, to be honest with you. But they're also amazing at supporting and bringing a CEO's idea to life. Now, idealists, on the other hand, they're creators, right? They're CEOs, they're visionaries who inspire. They can see the future, they create-ish, okay? They're organizers, they're not afraid to originate, right? They're not afraid to build something new. I'm talking my idea grinders. Can I get a whoop, whoop? <laughs> They are leaders and founders, right? They are the same leaders and founders that you see walking this great earth today. They are the ones who hire, and sometimes they're the ones that partner with realists, all right? Now, if you fell under the line of being a realist, that doesn't mean that you can't be a CEO. It just means that you have to learn how to balance your realist mentality against your idealist mentality and or partner with an amazing idealist, right? Because if you're partnering, then one of you are creating the ideas and then the other partner is executing the ideas. And then you two be a force to be reckoned with. Most realists have a hard time seeing the future because they are busy focused on what's in front of them only, right? It takes vision to be able to create something new. Now, with that being said, <laughs> most idealists typically have a hard time executing their ideas. They're like so far in the clouds planning that they never actually get to the point of doing, of executing, right? So it's important that you understand that it's all about balance. And in order to be a great CEO, you have to learn how to carry the mentality of both a realist and an idealist so that you can see what's going on around you and in front of you and then also be able to make strategic and solid decisions, right? But at the same time, you want to be far enough away from what's going on in front of you and around you that you can envision and dream and create ideas that will move society forward, okay? Now, Whatever your strong side may be, it's not right or wrong, okay? But you need to know what it is. And you need to know what it is so that you can enhance your strength and work on the other portion, right? Again, like find a partner or even outsource your weaknesses, right? Or your, your lesser, right? But the point is, you got to know who you are and where you stand. Does everybody understand that? Woo, okay, I see. <laughs> 
I see a lot of comments here. All right. All right. Being an idealist can be overwhelming at times. Yeah, she says, that's the very reason that I'm here. Yeah, put a one in the box if this makes sense. That's right. Some people know me and they know I like my ones. Okay, awesome. All right. Now, I need you to understand why this is so important to this training and to your growth learning journey around being going from employee to CEO. Because it's important regardless of whether or not you know, you have decided today that you're going to be an employee today and a CEO tomorrow, or whether you're a CEO today striving to be a better CEO tomorrow. It's always good to know where you stand so that, so that you'll know how to proceed to move forward. Now, what it's going to take to proceed to move forward is the big question. And I want to tell you, I want to give you the answer to that. OK, if you want to move forward. If you want to convert yourself from being an employee to a CEO, there is one thing that you must do more often than never, okay? This is the one thing that most people don't want to do though. They actually run from this. However, you know, many, you absolutely must do this though in order for you to move forward from being an employee to a CEO. So I want somebody to put in the chat box, D, what do I have to do to move from being an employee to a CEO? Who's asking that question? Who's asking me this question? Somebody asked me the number. That's the million dollar question here today, right? Who's asking me that question? I'm gonna see who the first person is that's gonna answer this question. <laughs> Cedric said, D, what needs to be done? Zahara said, hey, Zahara, D, what needs to be done? Jennifer said, what do I have to do? Okay, Aisha said, tell us the secret. Janice said, what needs to get done? <laughs> Latasha said, D, what do I have to do to move from being an employee to a CEO? That's a great question. I'm so glad y'all took the time to ask me. You got to drink a cup of FOD fuel. Hello. <laughs> you got to drink a cup of FOD fuel. I know y'all like, what? <laughs> Listen, some of you are like me. And you only got to drink this cup once in a lifetime, and it's enough to fuel everything inside of you. I'm talking every piece of individual audacity that you have within you to create, to achieve, and to soar, right? That's some of you. But others, well, I don't know. They got to drink a cup of fod fuel more often than... They're not, right? They've got to drink this fuel more often in order to push themselves out of their comfort zone, right? Now, many of you may be wondering, D, what the heck is FOD fuel? I see this question like, oh my gosh, so many people have, <laughs> have are putting in the box, what the heck is this? <laughs> what, what is FOD fuel, what, uh, D? What are you talking about? <laughs> I love your reactions. You're, you're really brightening my night. OK, well, let me just tell you right now. I myself, I'm just this is full confession because I think you guys I'm, I'm comfortable enough with you, with each of you to talk to you about my personal. I have had my fair share of FOD fuel. OK, I have literally overdosed on FOD fuel. I have barfed drinking FOD fuel. I have even cried drinking fod fuel okay and to be honest many of you have too you just don't realize you have right but most of you and i'm talking to you you know who i'm talking to yes you when you get a cup of fod fuel you throw it away run and you never look back <laughs> it's just too strong for you or maybe it's that you're not strong enough Hmm. However, when you ingest FOD fuel in your life and you let it flow through your system and you actually allow it to fuel the individual audacity within you, that's when you begin your journey of transitioning from that employee status to the CEO status. Believe it or not, it's not just about business, but the FOD fuel works in everyday life. It's just a matter of how you use it. 
So let's talk a little bit about what thought fuel truly is and why you should welcome a cup in your life right now. Rosalind, it is not fat free. <laughs> All right. So thought fuel. Thought fuel stands for fear, aggression, haters, and disappointment or dissatisfaction, either or. But it's one of those four things. And, and it, it's when one of those four things becomes your fuel to help you create a different version of yourself, to help you raise your standards, to increase your worth meter, to shift your very mindset. I'm talking to think differently. Thought fuel is needed in everybody's life. And as I stated before, most people get a cup of thought fuel and they throw it away from the moment it's presented in front of them. Oh yes, they run. I'm out of here. And not only do they run, they only look back to talk about it to their friends or to complain or to cry or to claim the nerve. I can't believe <laughs> because they're sensitive or because it doesn't feel good. And that nasty feeling, that nasty taste of fod fuel just seems so bad that they would rather run away and stay exactly where they are in life today rather than to continue to drink the cup, embrace the cup, feel the cup, and allow it to fuel them, to take them to the next level in their lives and or in their careers. And just a really quick example, and I know you guys know what I'm talking about. There was, <laughs> I have, <laughs> there was a young lady in one of my membership communities. This happened recently. I put some information out as I do because I expect us all to be CEOs. I'm hoping this young lady is on this call. And she did not read the instructions. And so she sent an email to my office and I directed her to a video that I had made that was a very strong video. And she responded back, ouch, you didn't have to be so mean about it. And I haven't seen or heard from her since. And I thought to myself, oh, she's running away from her fod fuel. <laughs> she's not embracing that fod fuel. She's not taking it in. She's allowing that fod fuel to, to ruin her, to give her an upset stomach. She's got diarrhea of the fod fuel. I know that was nasty, but I'm, I'm trying to keep, I want, I want you to visualize how you respond when you experience fear, aggression, haters, disappointment, or dissatisfaction. I want you to think about it because this plays a major role in you transforming yourself from an employee to a CEO. Can I get a one in the box if you feel where I'm going with this? Yes. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. All right. Now we're really going to dive into this concept here because many entrepreneurs and CEOs that you see today, they have had a massive dose, if not massive doses of fod fuel in their lives, which is why they're in the position that they're in today. All right. So let's dive into fod fuel a little more in depth so that you can see how you handle your cup of fod fuel. And let's start with the first letter which is F, which is fear. And I talk about this in depth in my book, Individual Audacity. I talk about this in depth in Individual Audacity, okay? But first, before we get into it, let's have another poll question, all right? Let's do another poll question here. The question on the table is, what type of fear do you think of or experience the most when it comes to starting or running a business or quitting your job to start and run a business? I'm, ooh, I'm so looking for the answers here. Uh, 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 oh, where's my music? All right. Mm. Mm, 
Mm, you got this. Mm, 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 mm. Stick it, stick it, stick it. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, yeah. Now, you guys can have multiple answers, right? You don't have to just stick with one because many of you feel differently on many different areas, right? Hello. And while you're still putting your responses in, I'm going to just read some of the responses that I see here. All right. Somebody says adversity will happen. Someone says I get more motivated when one of these things happen to me. <laughs> Somebody said I need some of some by the case. My biggest downfall is handling disappointments. This has kept me from going where I should. Right. Wow. And, and they said I'm being a realist. All right. That was I appreciate that transparency. I really appreciate that transparency. Thank you so much. Somebody said fear of failure. OK, somebody said they're dancing with me. <laughs> somebody said disappointment. OK, somebody said everyone is scared to fail. It's, it's the number one fear. OK, somebody said this is a tough it's kind of tough to answer. All right. Somebody else said, I have no answer. I've been on my own since 2015. Right. Somebody said not being good enough, fear, of failure, humiliation. Somebody said, but if you can't see beyond that, you'll never overcome. Right. Somebody said fear of winning. And, I, you know, it's so funny you say that because I actually had that as one of the answers and I took it off because I wasn't sure that anybody would be able to relate to that. But I'm so thankful that you mentioned that because there are a couple of more fears that I didn't list because this little system wouldn't allow me to go but so far. So when you read the book, you'll be able to see that and it's it's an exercise in the book very similar to this so you can define where you are, okay? Somebody said, I wouldn't have fear of success, but fear of success is very common. What if I get so successful that somebody tries to murder me? Or what if I get so successful that I can't handle my money? Or what if I get so successful, I become somebody different? Those, those are things that I hear all the time with my business coaching and my life coaching, all the time. That is not something that is uncommon. People fear. Yes, somebody else said, my fear is also being the victim of jealousy and envy. I appreciate your transparency. Fear of self-sabotage. Yeah. Somebody said, oh man, I never even thought of fear of success. Right. Somebody said fear of poverty can happen when you have a successful business and mismanaging your money. Yes. Someone said it took me forever to start this business. I've been dreaming of this business for 10 years, but I'm so afraid to fail. And that's why it took me forever to start. It was because of you that pushed me to do this. Mwah! You know, I love you. All right. I love that. Somebody said fear of failing because of the stigma that has been placed on me. OK, somebody said fear of failure has always been on my mind. I'm scared to fail in this industry, but I'm an optimistic person. Someone said fear of being a perfectionist. Someone said fear of failure to quit my career that I work so hard for and can't make ends meet anymore. Someone said fear of poverty can have. OK, I already read that. One. So you see, you're not the first of all, I read these responses because I want you to know that whatever you're thinking and feeling on the inside, you're not the only one. This is something that's very common, very, very common. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this. So we talked about fear of failure, fear of inadequacy, fear of humiliation, fear of poverty and fear. Oh, I did put on here fear of success. So let's talk about the numbers. 53% of the people on this call said that they have a fear of failure. Does that surprise you? 50, 52, the number just changed. Let me close the poll. Y'all got to stop <laughs> voting. So 52% said fear of failure. Okay. That's more of half of you on this call are afraid of failing. 41% said fear of inadequacy. Wow. 32% said fear of poverty, lack mindset. If you got fear of poverty, that's a lack mindset. We're going to shift that over the next few uh, sessions, right? You're getting a real therapy coaching session. Somebody said it's encouraging to know that I'm not alone. Yeah. 
14% said fear of humiliation. That means a lot of you don't even care if they laugh at you, <laughs> right? But you're more concerned about failing. And if you fail, then they will laugh at you, right? And then you'll be broke, right? That's the big fear because you're inadequate, right? Yeah, yeah, Zahara. That's, that's, that, that's how this all flows, right? So let's talk about this because if you're going to be a CEO, You've got to understand the role that fear plays in your life and in your business, okay? So first, fear is literally the scariest, most destroying untruth <laughs> in the world that people tend to fall in love with. I'm going to repeat that. Fear is the scariest, most destroying untruth in the world that people tend to fall in love with. But if I, if, but when you use fear as a fuel versus as a hindrance, you can become a very powerful creator, a very powerful leader, a very powerful CEO. Okay. Now it's no surprise that most people allow fear to rule their lives. You've heard me talk about it before. You've read it in my book. Many people fall in love with fear. They make love to fear. Ooh, fear, come here, baby. <laughs> they call upon it while they're awake and they call upon it in their dreams. I'm so afraid I'm gonna fail. Oh, I'm dreaming about it. I'm so afraid I'm not good enough. Oh, they're thinking about it in their mind. They talk about it throughout the day. Come on. They talk about it throughout the day. Oh my God, I'm so afraid this isn't going to work. How am I going to start this? This is going to work. This is not going to work. This is so crazy. Oh my gosh. People are going to laugh at me if I do this. I can't do this. Oh my gosh, I'm so afraid. Oh my gosh. If I do this and I fail, then I'm going to be broken. If I'm broke, how am I going to take care of my family? I'm so afraid. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm so afraid if I fail. I'm so afraid. They talk about it. They bathe with it at night. They in the tub washing themselves, talking about, oh my gosh, I don't know if I should start this business. If I start this business, I'm not going to have enough money. If I don't have enough money, then my kids are going to, if I don't, know, oh my God, I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid of what they're going to say. I'm so afraid what they're going to do. If I lose my car, I'm going to lose my car. I'm going to lose my car. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my house. Oh, they are in love with fear. <laughs> Somebody said, that's so true. Okay. They're in love with fear, but they can't help it. Right? They can't help it. They Facebook about it. How many people have seen y'all Facebook? How many people? You, I know many of you Facebook fear. Put those little those little memes up. <laughs> you start writing those little extra things on Facebook, all about your love affair with fear. Some people tweet about it. Yes, Lord, they tweet about. <laughs> They tweet about it, right? Fear is real for some people and it keeps them in employee status for the rest of their lives, even when they don't even really want it. It keeps them in employee status for the rest of their lives, even when they really don't even want it. But they literally can't help it because they have established such a strong connection, such a strong relationship with fear that they just simply have a hard time letting go. I mean, literally, they're in a dysfunctional, loving relationship with fear. If you are constantly thinking about the things that are not going right, if you're constantly thinking about your fears, and it is to the point that you are not stepping out and doing what your heart's desire I'm here to tell you right now, and some of you, this is going to be a major shock. You are in a dysfunctional relationship right now with fear. I want you to think on that for a moment. Because I don't think many of you even realize how much of a relationship you're in with fear. And all of my membership communities, there are at least five people that I can name off the top of my head that have been starting their businesses for two years or three years. They're in a horrific relationship with fear. 
some form of fear, right? But it's still with fear. But most CEOs understand this concept. I just want to tell you that. They understand the quote that Will Smith once said, fear is not real. It's a product of the imagination focusing on untruths for the present and the future. Hello. Hello. All right. Now, somebody wanted me to open up the line. So hold on one second. Tanisha wants to say something and I want you to be able to say something. Tanisha, you there? Yes, I'm here, Dee. Can you hear me? Yep, I hear you wonderfully. Share with us. Okay, I wanted to tell the group that in the beginning, Dee, I never shared this with you either. In 2015, after, of course, Dee Williams told me to do everything, but of course, Tanisha has to do things her way. Um, when I initially opened my business, the biggest fear for me was um, having being late on payroll. That was like my biggest fear, like to even start my business. I always was like, oh, what I what if what if I'm late on payroll? What if I'm late on payroll? What if I'm late on payroll? It was like it consumed me, to be honest with you, because it blocked me also from taking the dive until I finally did from starting because I always felt like, what if I'm late on payroll? Nobody that's like the worst thing in business, I think, that could ever happen. So it happened to me because instead of listening to D and going with um, a third party payer, I just had my own money because I didn't, I don't like to, I'm a control freak. I like to have control over everything. So I said, well, I'm gonna use someone else's money when I have my own. Well, at least that's what I thought because I set this contract up with my client and my client was supposed to send these payments to me on a timely basis. That did not happen. I end up being late on payroll because I had more employees than what I thought I would originally have to cover on um, the payroll. So I ended up being late and oh my God, it was the worst thing on earth for me. I mean, it was terrible. It was worth, I was, I was shameful. I was extremely mm -hmm. shameful and I was disappointed because I worked so hard and I, to, to do, to be great. And I never wanted those things to happen, but the fear that it would happen consumed me so much that it happened. So what I want to tell the people who, have that fear you have to let it go and for me right now this is my third year of business and i'm still fearful of and i don't know why and, and and you know what for me it's been something that's been something internalized for for a while in my life it's just i'm always fearful of the what ifs and i and i'm trust me i've been trying my hardest to let it go and that that has prevented me i know because i work hard and i have i've made lots of money i, I, I live a great comfortable financial life right now um and i do feel that i'm stable but the fear of the what ifs has has pretty much blocked things for me and yeah d that's what i wanted to share with you like being when you consume that in your mind and you constantly think like okay when i open up this is what's gonna happen this is what's gonna happen and you think about it so much that you internalize it and it happens so what mm -hmm. i want to tell you all is to, to let it go listen to d <laughs> because I, I mean i know a lot of us are probably control freaks you want things to just i want to be in charge of everything and that's been a big problem for me as well um i like to have control over everything this is especially when you sacrifice so much and you put everything on the line for your business that you don't want to give anyone else control um to let something go wrong so you have to trust people to 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 do things you have to listen to someone who knows more than you. Sometimes we feel that we don't know. She don't know. I'm going to do it my way. And that's me. I never said felt like D doesn't know um, because I trust her that she knows the business. But I felt like I'm going to do it my way. I don't want um, some using, utilizing a third party pair. I just got a check for $50,000. I'm, I'm getting a check coming in for $70,000. i am good. But in reality, sometimes you don't get your checks for four and five months. And then how are you going to cover your payroll? So it's better as that old that old saying says, CYA, cover your ass. Unless you have a million in the bank. Because before when, when you're doing really good, that client is going to say, hey, we need 10 people. And they say, hey, we need 20 people. And before you know it, you have 40 people on payroll and you're waiting on checks to cover it. What you going to do then? Mm -hmm. You're going to have people angry with you. You're going to have people upset with you. So I, would, I just would advise you definitely in the beginning until you have... Um, 
I said quarter of a million, you know, in your bank account to cover those payrolls. Not even that these days. When you're when you're growing, sometimes you grow rapidly before you even know it. So it's good to have that um, part, that person available. And although I still have the client because I have a really, really good relationship with the CEO and he was very understanding. But I would I mean, I just think about that. Like, what if that was it's just a small it's a small client here. They own like three facilities. But what had it been like a multi-million dollar company? That would have really been terrible for me. And that could have destroyed my business. So I just want to let you all know that don't internalize those fears. Just just let them go. Let them go. Flush them down the toilet. And so like, how are you? So I love the fact that you you acknowledge that and, and you see that in yourself. And you even mentioned like I still kind of fight with that sometimes. Definitely. What are some of the things that you do when you are you're walking down the street or walking down your steps or whatever the case and those thoughts come in your mind? How are you counteracting those thoughts at this point? I try to block them, but it's okay. still in the back of my head. And, and, and it's it's something personal that I have to deal with. And I have to, you know, I and I think a lot of your, your self-confidence about a lot of things right now, I'm working on feeding my brain versus just feeding my appetite. You know, we want like I'm learning that all of that stuff has an effect on your mindset. So mm -hmm. I have a better diet now. I'm exercising, you know, so I, you know, I, I believe as the older you get, you get wiser. I'm about to be 40 in December. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. But. I'm feeding my mind. You know, sometimes we just eat. You know, we're, we're you know, our culture is accustomed to eating chicken wings, greens, macaroni, cheese, you know, stuff like that. But all, I, all actuality, all that stuff is not good for us. So now I'm, I feel that, you know, we have to feed our brain, our spirit uh, with healthier, have a healthier diet, exercise. And um, because I have a I have a good team of people around me, I must say that like I have a good team of people. I'm I'm a I'm the only child, so I don't have a I'm I pretty much always been a person that's to myself. I don't like a lot of people. Um, my friends are the youngest friend I have is ten years. I don't I'm not open to meeting a lot of new people to have them into my personal space. I'm a very private person, but I do have a good team of supportive people around me. So, um, you know, I, I'm just working on the more confidence for myself is, you know, losing these weights, losing the weight and um, eating better and, and feeling more confident about myself. I think that all plays into my fear of things as well. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. You're so amazing. Isn't she awesome? I'm just going to give her some love for that. Just being transparent. That is, that's, that's such a major thing to do. And before I move to the next slide, I'm going to just read some of the comments here. Um, and they said that um, I need to fall out of love with fear then, right? Somebody said, fall in love with fear? Wow, never even thought about that. Um, somebody said, um, Kirk Franklin has a song called Hello Fear, and the message is powerful. Somebody else said, I broke up with fear. Somebody said, this is me. Somebody said, uh, this is so good, I hate I gotta go. <laughs> Somebody said, oh, D, you just hit the nail on the head for me. It's been too long for me starting my business. No more. Somebody said, who's concerned with payroll, D? That's not a part of my business model. That's because you're not in that class, Jonathan. <laughs> that's, that's for my staffing entrepreneurs. You're, you're in my other community. You're in my idea grinders. Okay. Somebody said, I'm more concerned about getting to the end of my life and not doing all the things I wanted to do. That's what keeps me going. Somebody said, I thought about payroll, too. Somebody said fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It's a product of our imagination causing us to fear things that do not at present and may never exist. This is near insanity. Do not misunderstand me. Danger is very year, real, but fear is a choice. So you already know it was a movie that Will Smith was in with his son. And um when I heard that, I rewound that that part over and over again to dictate it because that rang so true to me, right? Somebody said, "What? Um, um, thanks for sharing. When your mind thinks something, it manifests it into reality, good or bad. Somebody said, this is great info. info. Somebody said, that's scary, growing rapidly before you even thought of it. Thanks for sharing. Tanisha, I have missed payroll. They're most entrepreneurs, many, I'll say many, have missed payroll. And it is an ugly feeling. That is literally, you want to ball up in a corner and simply die. 
the worst thing that you can possibly do as a CEO is miss payroll. But you are not the only person that that has happened to. As a matter of fact, there are multi-billionaires today that have missed payroll in the very beginning of their journey, which is one of the reasons why they are where they are today. Those are called, um, what do you call, army scars, right? Army scars. Somebody said, even if you try to block Tanisha, they will come even more. So just let them come and observe them as a third person. You'll know they're temporary and they'll go away. Be easy. Somebody said, do it, girl. Somebody said, wonderful testimony. Me and fear have filed a divorce. Filed for divorce, somebody said. Somebody said, I had such a bad day and I feel this seminar is a godsend. Your day was awesome, honey. You had some thawed fuel today. Somebody said, I'm ready to kick fear in the ass, right? Somebody said, there's a Bible verse about taking every thought captive and making it obedient to God. I use this verse to stop my thoughts and make them more in line with what I want for my life. Somebody said, but isn't some for some fear normal? Yeah, you know, and that's what we're going to talk about to do today. Somebody said fear is comfortable to me. Somebody said you have to acknowledge your thoughts of fear and stop them in their tracks. Somebody said all of that sounds great and all and all, but we are all afraid of something, some big, some small. Anytime we hesitate before making a decision about our lives, business, etc., versus going all in without regard because we are afraid. And let me comment on that. You're a thousand percent right about that. But what this is about is what you do with that fear. I never say you should not have fear. But it's all about what you do with this fear that defines how you move, how you shift from being an employee to an entrepreneur. That is the core that we want you to take away from what's going on today. OK. OK. Percy, you got to join in through the computer so you can see and, and you can still make comments if you want. I can bring you in. Somebody said 100 D. Now, before I move to my next slide, this is not in my script. I want to read something to you. I just read this to one of my staffingpreneurs today. And um, and many of you who have been on my live, one of the, some of my live webinars, I read this quite often because fear, a lot of it has to do with risk taking, right? So I'm going to read something about risks really quickly. And some of you have heard this before. This is new for some of you. Risks. We don't take risks because we're afraid we will fail. What if it doesn't work? The rich think that if they don't take risks, they have already failed. We ask, what if the business goes belly up? I will be a failure. The rich think if I don't take a chance on the business, I'm already a failure. We live in a world that has God unemployed. We make all our bill payments, our Visa and MasterCard payments and our car payments. We can do all of that on our own. We really don't need God. But God so desperately wants us in a place where we need him, where we step out and say, OK, God, for me, this is impossible. With, but with you, nothing is impossible. And doing this, I have employed God. I have given him something to do in my life. We are now working together. The Bible says that God directs our steps. It doesn't say he directs our sitting. We don't just sit back and wait for God to drop a million dollar idea in our laps. We start to step out. Once we take some steps, God can say, okay, go this way. Now turn that way. My dad always said that you cannot steer a bicycle that is not moving. It's time that we get that bicycle going. It's time we step out and take some risks. The wealthy are risk takers. Does that mean you will never fail? Absolutely not. The wealthy have failed hundreds of times, more than you and me, and that's why they're wealthy. The wealthy know that failing does not make you a failure. Never trying does. That was from the book, Think Like a Billionaire, Become a Billionaire. As a man thinks, so is he. Author is a pastor, Scott Anderson. You should pick that book up. It is a very powerful book. 
All right. So I hope I didn't step on anybody's toes. I'm going to keep with my presentation. All right. So here we go. Now, fear of failure, fear of inadequacy, fear of humiliation, fear of poverty. OK, all are associated with taking risks stepping out of your comfort zone. And most people are so in love with fear, they never get to experience the level of success that they deserve, nor are they able to experience the opportunity of being a successful CEO. How many of you have ever failed at something so bad that it absolutely drove you to success? For Richard Brunson, it was school. For Colonel Sanders, it was his chicken recipe. For Thomas Edison, it was the light bulb. How many of you have ever felt in, so in, inadequate about something so much that it fueled you to become a master? For the rapper, entrepreneur, and philanthropist, Master P, it was the environment that he grew up in and not being able to support his family. For Bruce Lee, it was karate. How many of you have been so humiliated that you decided, I am not going to show I'm sorry, let me do that again. That you were going to show everyone who you were not, what you were not. So humiliated. You proved to them that their laughs did you great versus doing you harm. Like the Wright brothers, for example, who were two American aviators, engineers, innovators, right? Inventors and aviation pioneers who generally credited, who are generally credited with inventing, building, and flying the world's first successful airplane. They laughed at them. Ha, 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 ha. Flying? What? Please. Right? Please. They laughed at them. Now we fly daily. How many of you have ever felt a fear of poverty so bad that you willed wealth or better life, at least for yourself? Like the famous actor Jim Carrey, who dropped out of high school when his father was laid off to pay the bills. Kerry worked as both a janitor and a security guard, but his family eventually lost their home despite his efforts and were forced to live in a van. He is now estimated to earn approximately $20 million per film. Or even Oprah Winfrey, who was raised by her grandmother, was born into poverty in rural Mississippi to a teenage single mother. Winfrey has spoken about experiencing significant hardship as a child. And the fact that she was raped at the age of nine and became pregnant at 14, her son died in infancy. She is now worth more than $2.9 billion. Fear fuel is some of the most life changing fuel, yet so many of you reject it. And I want to ask you a question. Will you let fear make you or break you? Put a one in a box if you're going to let it make you. Put a two in the box if you're going to let it break you. Come on, tell me. Yes. Yes. I see ones flowing through. Yes. Let it make you. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Let it, let it push you. Okay? That's that individual audacity that I talk about. Okay? Somebody said, this is giving me so much life. All right? Now, let's talk about aggression fuel. Ooh, aggression fuel, all right? So I got a question here in the launch. I got the launch, I just launched the poll. What types of aggression do you think of or experience the most when it comes to the thought of or dealing with starting and running a business or quitting your job to start a business? The options are migraines and headaches, mental depression, be honest, because a lot of you won't, don't want to be honest about this. Misunderstandings and, and, and minors out of proportion. And so blowing misunderstandings and minors out of proportion. And I know everybody better put something in the boxes in my staff and preneurs community. Because <laughs> y'all, I'll say something small and it's like, oh, <laughs> don't even try it. Angry outbursts, alienating yourself from society, from your friends, from your family. Let's keep it real here. I know it happens. Yeah, this one is tough. Somebody said, this is tough. Somebody said, oh, it's a combination of all. Yes. 
Be honest with yourself because when you can acknowledge it, you can grow. It's when you can't acknowledge it that you stay in the same place. I'm going to tell you guys one of as, as powerful and strong and energetic as I am. If I am irritated with someone who does not think things through, I actually have angry outbursts. And it's not even about starting a business. It's about the frustration around that person not loving themselves to think things through. Right. And so when when I think about that and think about why am I getting so angry? Why am I? Why? When I start sweating, like I'm angry. Right. And it's like, hmm, I need to evaluate that. And some people say it's just D or it's your passion, but it's still something core that's going on in there. Yeah. Somebody says to the point, yeah, I mean, people are really getting in. I appreciate it. I'm not saying any names because there are personal things being said here. Some people said, I would say all. Someone said, you have to go through it to make, to make a breakthrough. Somebody said, wow, do you have me thinking with this one? Somebody says, I'll step back until I learn more. Someone says, combo for me, depression and cutting myself off from others, angry outbursts. Yeah. Somebody said the depression is real and the angry outbursts are real to the point where it leads to marital problems. Somebody said it's a cross between alienating myself because I may be depressed due to the business isn't going the way I expected it to go. Somebody said I have depression and anxiety. All my problems are in my head. Someone said the headaches are real. Someone said it's all of them at the same time and it's extremely scary. So first of all, I want to say this was a very hard one for me to put in here. It was a very personal one. I appreciate you guys being so transparent. This is real, right? This is real life stuff going on here. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. Many of us are experiencing the same. I'm reading the comments out loud because I want you guys to hear each other. Many times we are in this business, right? And we think we're doing these things on our own. We're going through this on our own. So we put this facade up in front of people, but on the back end, if we're getting headaches, we're depressed, we're blowing things out of proportion, we're going into our shell, got this little stank funk about us, yelling and angry, don't even really know why, you know? Somebody said it's because of the fear, you know what I'm saying? Somebody said, why are you all up in my life? <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about aggression fuel. Aggression is one of my favorite oh wait before i do that hold on let me give you the poll i think that's important okay i think that's important so the poll is 10 percent of the people on this call said physical migraines or headaches plague them when it comes to aggression fuel 26 percent said mental depression 10 percent said blow misunderstandings and my just out of the water, just blowing it out of proportion. Then we had 42% said they alienate themselves. And I know that to be factual because some of you will be in the groups and you'll be so active and full of energy. And the moment you see somebody else get success and you haven't made yours yet, you check out for six months, you check out for a year. And then you come back and say, I'm back. Guess what? I'm back. I know what's going on. 12% said angry outbursts. Okay. All right. Someone said, what I find is that when it comes to your livelihood, there is no time to share, especially with people who don't understand your mindset. Their opinions are not necessary. And sometimes keeping to yourself is the safest way to avoid outbursts and misunderstandings. And I have to agree with you to a certain extent. I think that's what drives people crazy. And you've got to find a safe zone, right? Which is why I build the communities that I do. Each and every one of you are a part of some type of community that I have in some way, form or fashion, which means that each and every one of you know that I expect nothing less than pure love flowing in my groups, pure support, pure understanding. 
even when you piss somebody off or even when they piss me off. But I like for my communities to be safe havens because I didn't pull the statistics and I need to. And we have a couple of psychiatrists in one of my groups, but the suicidal rate for entrepreneurs is out of this world. And I believe many of them commit suicide because they don't have anybody to talk to. They don't have somebody that they feel like can understand the situation that they're in. So when you leave it all on the inside and you ball it up on the inside, you're cutting yourself off from the goodness that is ready to flow to you, through you, around you, under you, over you, in you. And let me just tell you, I don't know what your religious beliefs are, okay? And mine aren't the orthodox beliefs. But what I will tell you is this. Everything good is your birthright. That is your birthright. So when you cut yourself off from that, you are cutting yourself off from what you may consider to be your God. Why? God is high energy. What we consider to be God, the spiritual being, that spiritual, it's, it's good energy. So when we sit in a space of, of I got to close myself in, nobody understands me. That's not true. That's not real. And that is not only aggression, but it is also fear. And it's aggression and fear being used to destroy you versus to help expand you. Right. But that's what this is about. So I told you I'm going to shift you from employee to CEO. Does that mean CEOs don't experience aggression? It doesn't mean that. Steve Jobs was one of the most meanest CEOs on the planet. Every book that I have ever read, everything, every book that I have ever read talks about what uh, the, the, the type of boss he was. OK, so that doesn't mean you're not going to have it's what you do with those things. OK. Somebody said, I said depression because I gather lots of information, but don't put them into action soon enough. I'm not the only one. That doesn't make you a bad person. OK. Yes, he was the greatest visionary we've ever seen. But at what cost? He's not even here now. What you what you what you put out is what you get back. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> OK, somebody said, I agree with what you're saying, but at one point this was my reality. Surrounding yourself with supportive people and love rectifies that. I now have that. So my aggression is now tamed. It still exists, but it's minimal. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. I want I'm showing you guys. I want you to look at the N word fuel. OK, fuel. That's what this is about. Fuel. How are you using this? OK. So let's talk about aggression fuel. Aggression is one of my favorite fuel types because it gets me revved up every time. Wow! I get revved up. Let me share a few examples with you and show you how aggress aggression can be one of your best friends. Okay? When someone or something makes you angry, aggression can be your best friend. When someone pushes you out of your comfort zone, it can be your best friend because you get angry when they do that. How many times somebody tell you something to piss you off, you get angry, you walk away, right? Or they start cursing at you. What the F are you doing? Don't you know what you're doing? I'm going to share a story with you. So my son is, is a genius. If, if any of you don't know that, I'm not saying that just to be his mom, just because I'm his mom, but his IQ is off the chart. And he's a very arrogant young man, extremely arrogant because from the day he was conceived, I told him he was greater than everyone. I don't know if that was a good thing or not, but that's how I raised this particular child. And so he's a manager at a retail store and he's had a very frustrating time recently because he's so good at what he does. They refuse to staff his department because they know that he can do it by himself. They don't have to hire anybody. Well, that ticks him off because he feels like they're taking advantage of him. So there's a young lady that works at his job and she's considered to be a manager or a supervisor. And she walks up to him. This just happened last week. And he tells her, don't talk to me. He says or just very bluntly, don't talk to me. This is not the day. Well, she didn't take him seriously and began to talk to him. And he had an angry outburst. 
and said some very horrible things to her to the point where she said, you didn't have to say those things. He said, then go tell a manager. And she did. So management came and asked him, did you say these things? He said, I sure did. And he said, mom, I was prepared to get fired because I'm sick and tired of them taking advantage of me. I'm tired of working this full department seven days a week and goes on and on and on. And he tells them exactly how he feels ready for them to give him papers. And at the end of the conversation, they looked at him and said, I admire your passion. He said he looked at them with the biggest query on his face. Passion? You call that passion? I'm angry. But he let it go because he thought, hmm, I'm still able to keep my job, right? So the young lady has stayed clear from him since that happened. So today I asked in light of this training, I said, uh, what happened with the young lady that, um, that you were so nasty to? He said, oh, she stays very clear to me. But one of the things that I told her that day is that you're a mediocre manager. You're mediocre. And then you come over here and, and talk to me. I just told you don't talk to me. I don't deal with mediocre people. You've been here longer than I have, but you act like you're a, a one of just one of the employees. So that was kind of some of the things that he said to her. He said, mom, she doesn't say anything to me. But when I tell you this lady has stepped her game up, that day when I talked to the managers, they said, she's a good employee. Why'd you do that? He said, today they walked up to me and said, what happened to her? She is blowing it out of the water. So that young lady, she took something. My son made her angry. He darn near cursed at her. He told her like it was. He told her something that she didn't want to hear. He even insulted her. He was mean to her. Yes, AJ, he hurt that ego. He pushed her out of her comfort zone to the point that she took that aggression fuel and she made it work for her. And she came back in to the point where she's turning every head in the entire place. Yes, Kevin. He pushed her past her fears. And you know what he said to me today? I have a different level of respect for her. Like I didn't realize she had it in her. Wow, that was interesting. What do you know? So I guess it is true, Ma. Sometimes you can be really hard on somebody and make them angry and they can take that and they can either walk around, walk away, put a middle finger up, cuss you back out, try to beat you up, uh, blow your house up. Uh, uh, beat you up and all of those things, or they can take it, internalize it, and show you otherwise. Everything that happens to you is something to push you forward. Don't be so sensitive because somebody tells you something you don't like to hear, okay? Don't be so sensitive. There was a lady recently who was building some of my funnels for me, right? Or I wanted her to. And I give her like my little spiel on what I want. And she's like, how about you call me back when you're a little more organized? What? The nerve. Excuse me? I, I just told you I don't know what I'm doing and you're going to insult me? This is what I'm thinking in my mind. And I said to her, I'm very organized. What are you talking about? She's clear you're, clearly you're not. I don't have time to deal with somebody like you. And I was like, oh, got off the phone and I immediately got my ish together. I pulled a spreadsheet out. I said, who she think she is going to tell me I'm not organized. Bam, 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 bam. I know what I want. Bam, 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 bam. I, who, oh, man, that mofo, I gave her the blues in my mind. But you know what? She helped me. So when I got on the line with the next person I was interviewing, I was way more organized. And that was one thing they couldn't say about me. So what did I do? I took that aggression fuel and, and, and pulled something out of myself to get where I want to do. Latasha, Latasha, I didn't mean to call your name, but she said, I do some of the best work when I'm angry. <laughs> me too, Latasha. I ain't going to lie. Me too. Me too. Okay. There is an entre there's a, a staffing preneur that I work with on a one on one basis. I am so rough on this young lady 
to the point that if you heard the recordings, you would say, oh my gosh, D, I can't even believe that is you. When I say I am rough, I am rough. I say things that you wouldn't even believe. I'm like, are you kidding me? What are you doing? I'm rough. I even told this staffing preneur, you're not fit to be a staffing preneur. This isn't for you. Maybe you should think of doing something else. And the moment I said that to the staffing preneur, no, 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 no. Let me tell you why. They started to get their content together. They started to get, because I tried to take it away from them. It's like, yeah, you ain't serious. You're playing. I'm not here to play with you. I don't care if you paid your money. I'm here to help you break, make your business grow. So if you're going to play, get on out of this business. Start something else. Dude, let me give you a whole different business idea. This isn't for you. And I forced that staffing preneur to dig deep within to figure out, is this really for me? And how bad do I want it? You understand? So don't let somebody else's, you know, something like anger is okay. Depression, okay, right? All of these things that we're feeling, these aggression type of things, they're okay. It's what you do with them. It's what you do with them that defines how you shift from an employee to a CEO, okay? All right? All right. <laughs> All right, now we're getting somewhere. Big question. Will you allow aggression to make you or break you? Put a one in the box if it's going to make you. Put a two in the box if it's going to break you. Where you at? Where you at? Mm -mm. Where you at? Mm -mm. Where you at? Whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Fire on this call tonight. Fire on this call tonight. Yes. Okay. Now let's talk about haters fuel. Woo! Everybody, anybody ever heard the term? Let your haters be your motivators. This is one of my favorite terms on the planet. Somebody say yes. Now listen, we got another question in the box. This is our last launch. So I would poll. So I want everybody to participate. I can see the particip participation rate. Okay. I want 100% participation. I'm not going to move forward until everybody votes. What type of haters have you encountered or experienced the most when dealing with starting or running a business or quitting your job to start a business? You can answer with more than one. Okay, we got ex friend haters. <laughs> Somebody said ex friend haters, family haters. That's an option. Friend haters. Only 35% of people have voted. Spouse haters. Whew. Coworker haters. Okay. I am surprised to see church haters. Let me put my poll in. Church haters were for me. <laughs> I'm serious. Y'all so y'all must be going to some nice churches. Because for me, it was definitely church haters. They told me, please stop talking about business all the time. Oh my gosh, it's so annoying. Oh my gosh, I walked away and was like, my feelings were hurt. I was thinking to myself, what? <laughs> what do you mean? I thought we were trying to get better in love and Christ. No, uh-uh, honey, church haters, they were serious. Somebody laughed at me and said, church haters laugh out loud. <laughs> it's a serious thing out here. Okay, 71% have voted. I'm not moving forward until 100% of people have voted. Is your fam? Have you experienced family haters? Where's my maracas? Family haters, friend haters, uh huh, spouse haters, uh huh, co worker haters, uh huh, church haters. Who are your haters? Family haters, friend haters. Only 80% voted. Where's my the 20%? All right, keep it on. I'm not moving. 84% voted. We missing people. Who? Who are your haters? Your haters. Who are your haters? Your haters. Who are your haters? Oh, your haters. 
I guess I'm not gonna get the last couple of people to vote. We are 84%. Oh my gosh, Noni's singing with me. <laughs> she loves it when I sing. <laughs> Kristen said, wake up, people. <laughs> So somebody said, I didn't have any haters starting out, but I do find some employees are haters and wish they were in my position. Uh -huh. Yeah. Somebody said, one reason people hate is because they can only see you through their own lack of zeal. Keep moving forward. Yes, I should have put in there employer hater. Yes. Former employers. I have an employer. I got a couple of employer haters. Listen, I got fired y'all i got fired off a contract a recruiting contract one time it was the most interesting thing i could see what was going to take place in the company i'm a visionary i'm an idealist and this company i was working for only had one contract and it was a government contract and my boss who was the vp um who and i'm going to tell you why you'll know why i'm saying that she was a hispanic lady she said um, she went on vacation. And while she was on vacation, I had to report to the president of the company. And so when the president of the company came to my office, I was a contract, I was director of recruiting, but they're on a contract. And she says, um, you wanna go have lunch with me? I guess she wanted to get to know me a little bit better or what have you. I said, oh yeah, sure, I'll go to lunch. And um, so we went to lunch, we went shopping after lunch and she started asking me questions, never about the VP, but more about the company structure and what I thought needed to be changed or could be changed to better the company. I said, well, you only have one real contract. If something was to ever happen with this contract, your company would go under. So I think being as though you're in the government space, it would really be important or it would be a smart decision to open up some offices or even divisions and on the corporate side. And, you know, there are a lot of companies that would take the experience that you guys have built your capabilities on the on the government side and they would love to do business with you. And she said, where would you open an office at if we were to do something different? I said, Atlanta, because we lived in D.C. at the time. And she said, Atlanta's great. And I told her all the reasons why I went and did a presentation. She loved it, gave her stats, everything. She loved it. The vice president came back and I went on vacation. And then my staff started calling me on vacation, said she's going through your computer. She's going through your desk. She's going through, going through, going through. And I was thinking, why is this lady going through my stuff? So I finally called the office. The president won't answer my call. The vice president uh, wouldn't answer my call. And so I'm one of those people that read energy. And I realized that something was about to go down. So I show up to work the day after my vacation, when my vacation ended, I went and put my key fob on the door and it didn't work. <laughs> I was like, why is my key fob not working? And so y'all know how I am. I, everybody loves me, right? So the, the, the uh, maintenance man saw me, D, what's wrong? Your key fob not working. I said, I don't know what's going on. My key fob not working. He's, all right, come on, I'll let you in, take you up in the elevator. So he takes me up in the elevator, we're talking, and I'm taking the key fob off of my chain because I've realized what's really happening. Yeah, you already know, Trudy. So I take the key fob and I put it on the boss's desk before she ever comes in. I go into my office and I start packing my stuff up because I realize if they turn my key fob off, and I'm typically the first person in the office as I was that day, and the first person, the last person leaving. So when she comes in, she says, I need to see you. I said, great, my stuff was already packed and ready. And so she comes in the office, she's got the HR person sitting in there. She says, unfortunately, we're gonna have to let you go. And I said, on what grounds? And she said, because you have multiple resumes with different things on them. I said, so what? <laughs> I said, and how do you know that? She said, I went through your computer. I said, isn't that a, um, like, that's, that's a breach of privacy. Nothing is private when you're working for this company. I said, okay, that's cool. That's fair. I can take that. I said, um, she said, so I need you to tell me how you've done the last few things. She wanted me to give her all the processes that I created because I was creating an SOPs. I told her, hell no. And <laughs> she said, what? I said, no. And she said, why? I said, because you're dismissing me on the strength of nothing. So I already have packed my stuff. The key fob is on your desk. You can take it and stuff it. And I can, you know, and I'm on my way out the door. So the the lady, the HR lady, 
says, okay, well, she's realizing that she's, you know, that we're letting her go. So I'm going to leave the office. And so I looked at her for a moment and I said, you know, why, why are you even acting this way? Like before you went on vacation, everything was cool. Like, why are you even treating me like this? And she stood up on the, like stood up, slammed her hand on the desk. I, I promise you guys slammed her hand on the desk and said, I will not allow one black woman to come in here and to take my job. And I looked at this lady like she had lost her everlasting mind because it was so interesting. I never once was thinking about taking this lady's job. I had no desire. I had not even a 0.1% in my mind, when I tell you guys not 0.1% of my mind, did I ever think about taking this lady's job? I was thinking, I want to help the company grow. Y'all know how I am, right? But for her, she thought that I was the hater, but she was actually the hater. And she thought I tried to take her job. So I looked at her and I said, okay, thank you. I said, I, I now clearly understand. Just for the record, I wasn't trying to take your job. Right. And it seems like a pretty stressful job, as a matter of fact. But I do appreciate this experience and I wish you all the success in this company. I went and got my things. I walked downstairs. I got to the bottom of the street corner. And at this time I was married to Lyric's dad and I cry my eyes out. When I say I was standing on 8th Street, Washington, D.C., bawling. <laughs> heart broken could not believe this lady had did this to me has said these things have felt this way uh maybe a year went by and one of the young ladies that i had hired there who was the receptionist called me you know in dc everybody rides the metro she says d uh have you looked at the the washington post i said no she said you need to go pick the washington post up now and I said, I'm on the bus. She said, get off the bus and get the Washington Post now. So I hop off the bus at the very next stop. I go to the little newspaper machine, put my money in, pull the Washington Post, go to the local section. And lo and behold, they had shut the company down. Why? Because they only had one contract. And the government felt like they were, they were supporting the DC government. And the D.C. government felt like they must have been getting all of this business unethically. And so they started to do research into the business and found out that that very VP, that she was sleeping with people. <laughs> she she had all types of things, little extra deals going on on the side and the company shut down. So ask me where the CEO is now. Somebody put in the box, where's the CEO of that company? Oh, I, she follows me on LinkedIn. Somebody just asked me. Go ahead, ask me. I'm ready. Anybody want to know? She's gone back to a regular job as a developer. She's a developer. Yeah, no business, no more. Do you know where the VP is? She's making about 250,000 a year trying in her business, the same business she's been trying to start for 10 years. Oh, she follows me too. So let me just tell you, your haters can be your best, best fuel. Your best fuel. You guys are here with me today because my ex boss was my hater. <laughs> He said, nobody's ever going to buy recruitment and staffing training, D. <laughs> and I promise you, I wasn't angry before he said that. But when he said that, oh, my gosh, there was a fire that lit inside of me. I was so hot that my skin turned blue. So who the heck do this guy think he is trying to tell me what I can't do? You understand? I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go home and I'm going to drink a bottle of wine and I'm going to wake up and I'm going to start my own business. <laughs> like, really? So many people allow their haters to dictate their level of success. However, it is your haters that should be fueling you.
your hater fuel. Say what? Tell me again. Say it louder. That's what this picture is for. Say it louder, family. Say it louder, friends. Let me hear your spouse. Coworkers, tell me more. Somebody said that I had church haters. But how about ex-boss haters? Keep it coming. On my YouTube videos, my Facebook videos, these people are brutal. Ronaldo, I want to lie with Ronaldo one day. He was like, oh my gosh, D, I didn't even realize you got it as bad as you did. I was just looking at one of your videos. I looked at the comments and I was like, these people are horrible. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it's serious business. But do you know what I do? I, be, I make more videos. I impact more lives. So what do you do when the haters are coming at you? What do you do when your family is telling you that things aren't working right? 27% of the people on this call said they got family haters. 27%. You understand? 24% said their friends are haters. They ain't real friends. But you know what? I would keep them around because they would keep me fueled. That's right. I work harder to prove them wrong, someone says. 11% said their spouse is a hater. Somebody said, keep going, show them better than you can tell them. Yes. 38% said coworker haters. That's insane. You understand? And 0.1%, which is D, said church haters. <laughs> Somebody said it really hurts when it's your best friend. I've experienced that. But that person is no longer my best friend. Somebody says it really hurts when it's your own flesh and blood. They become jealous. Yeah, it hurts. But you know what? Somebody else said I rise above. You understand? It burns on the inside, but instead, somebody said, I sort of keep that calmly in the back of my mind without getting angry. It's hard, but I'm working on it. I wouldn't even phase it. You know what I'm saying? I would take that and be like, check. Thank you very much. Because I'm telling you, in a couple of years or a couple of months or however you see yourself, wherever you see yourself, you will be different. And then what you're going to say? Y'all read, and if you follow me on Facebook, y'all know that I got pregnant when I was 11 and had my first child when I was 12. And my family, oh, they hurt me so bad. My grandmother lied to me on her deathbed, but I read her diary one day. This is very personal. And she wrote in her diary that she told my mom to kill me because I was pregnant, because she didn't want to harnish, har um, um, tarnish the name of the family. And I never forget that day because I remember walking into the kitchen, seeing my mom crying profusely. I don't want to, I don't want to send her away. I don't want to send her away. I don't want to do it. Right. I don't want to do it. And wondering what my mom was talking about later went into my grandmother's diary and saw that I was so angry with my grandmother to the day she died. Right. I would go to church and there were people in particular, one lady, my best friend's mom, I went to talk to my best friend and she told my mother, your daughter can't be near me. If she touches her, she'll get pregnant. Nobody even ever asked me how I got pregnant or what happened. They just made assumptions about me. You know, I had the worst childhood around that pregnancy. I was literally tortured every day of my pregnancy. Tortured. When I say tortured, I mean tortured because I was 11 and 12 years old pregnant, as if at some point in history, our grandmothers or great grandmothers didn't get married at that age, right? And everything from that moment on, you guys are living my why. Each and every one of you right now are living my why. Because they told me I was gonna be everything that I was that I am not now. That's what they told me. And I said, keep talking to me. Tell me again. Oh, right. You think I'm contagious? Tell me again. You think I suck? Tell me again. What? You think I'm a whore? Tell me again. That, tell me. Keep telling me. I wanted to hear it 
every time I heard it, I got angrier. And the more angry I got, the more determined I became. And then I, I ended up not having parents after a period of time. I had to live on my own, got my first place when I was 16, 15 and 11 months to be exact. I was on bed rest with my second child. I had no parental guardianship whatsoever. So I couldn't even enroll myself into high school. So I had to drop out. And so then they had something else to say about me. <laughs> oh, we knew it was going to happen. <laughs> she ain't about to do nothing. I said, tell me more. Tell me more. I cried. I was angry, but I was determined that that, that the life they thought that they created, the story they created for me, I was determined that I was going to be in control of my life and that I was going to create my own story. People ask me every day, why are you so happy? How are you so positive? Where do you get that energy? It's the individual audacity in me. It's that hater fuel. It's that aggression fuel. It's that fear fuel. You understand what I'm saying? Many of you experience these things and you fall apart. You fall apart. You walk away from your ideas. You walk away from your businesses. You blame everybody else but yourself. And you allow those things to keep you from living the life that you want to live. It ends here today. What's your excuse for real, for real? What type of fuel are you drinking? Are you drinking fog fuel? Because that's the fuel that I want you to drink. Some of you are going to have to drink it more often than you don't, more often than you don't want to. You understand? More often, but that's the fuel that's going to, that's going to create your why. That's the fuel that's going to take you to where you want to be. Keep it. Look at, look at the little people here laughing at this, you know, they pointing. What is she doing? Hello, tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. You understand? Tell me more. Somebody said you are so correct when emotion said, I feel like not doing anything because the focus shifts. But you have the ability to shift your focus wherever you choose to. You have more power in you than you even know. You have the individual audacity to make you to change your life in seconds. For real. Somebody said, this is deep. Okay, I'm going to lighten it up. <laughs> I just want to give you guys some examples and some context, though. I don't mean to make things deep, but I want to give you some context. So that haters fuel. My question to you is, will you allow the haters to make you or break you? Put a one in the box. If you want, if you're going to allow the haters to make you, put a one. If you're allowing them to break you, put a two. We got more work to do if I see twos. I love you more, Cedric. <laughs> Somebody said, I agree. This was so needed. I watched a video of David Goggins. Loved it. Strongly recommended. It's in YouTube. Definitely will check it out. Yes. All right. We almost done. I know I've been kidnapping you. Last one. Disappointment fuel and or dissatisfaction fuel. I'm not going to go hard. I already knew that I was going to take up a lot of time. So I just skipped you guys on this one. But I'm going to tell you this. Drink the fuel and be great. Allow the disappointment to fuel you. Don't allow it to put you back into that, that space. Allow it to fuel you. You're unhappy with something. You're unhappy with the way something is going in the business. Allow it to fuel you to create more ideas. You're disappointed that you didn't go where you wanted to go. Allow it to fuel you. This is your time. You define your level of success. I promise you. I promise you. It is nothing around you. It is not your lack of money or the amount of money that you have. I can tell you that right now. For coming from a young lady who had started with nothing, it, the lack of money does not keep you from being successful. I can tell you that right now within the most sincere, with the most sincerest way, with the most sincere heart. I can tell you right now that the haters do not define your success. 
I can tell you that your stank attitude when things ain't going right, do, that will define your success, but only if you allow it. <laughs> you got to drink the fog fuel and you got to drink it like it's a cup of Starbucks coffee. And you got to take that fog fuel and you got to walk with it. And on every freaking time, something shifting you in the wrong way, I want you guys to say, oh my gosh, I'm drinking some fog fuel today. <laughs> Put a one in the box if you feel that energy. Oh my gosh, I think I'm drinking some fog fuel today. Yes, that's okay. Yes, the heart said, I've already put it on my computer. That's okay. Fog fuel is cool. It's just what you're going to do with it. That's it. What you're going to do with it. All right. Woo! All right. Now, fear, aggression, haters, disappointment, or dissatisfaction is fog fuel. Okay. If you want to learn more about fog fuel, my upcoming book talks about it in individual audacity. And then we will be going live later this year with workshops around FOD fuel. You guys have only gotten a quarter of what that workshop will be. All right. Just want to throw that out there at you. And when you see the replay, you'll see where you can order the pre the um, the pre version. Your FOD fuel helps you create your why. Please allow that FOD fuel to help you create your why. Now. Oh, that was on me. Let's talk about the CE mind, CEO mindset formula. People are generally under the impression that you cannot teach common sense. Some people even go as far as to say either you have it or you don't. But that's really a limitation. It's an, and it's also a failure of creation. Just like there is an awareness that it's only impossible until you do it. I'm here to break that limitation finally. I'm here to show you that you can teach and gain common sense, CEO common sense, even. You do it all the time, right? Without being aware of that, you, that you're even doing it. Now you're all here because you want to gain the common sense of the CEO, right? Well, you're here because you are a CEO and you have the mindset to be a CEO, right? That's common sense in itself right there. You're here on this call to better yourselves. So today I'm not just teaching common sense, but I'm giving the tools the guideposts to teach common sense as a CEO. I'm instilling that in you, okay? I'm instilling that you can do whatever you choose to do throughout this learning lesson. But what you must do is to have CEO common sense, okay? The poll is not closed. Somebody says the poll closed. I don't see the content after the haters. Nope. The um the poll is done. I'm gonna close the poll now though. Only 90%. We missed it. There are no more polls. Next time I'm gonna make some more because I see y'all like them. <laughs> All right. Somebody said I need CEO common sense. Somebody said I believe everyone has common sense. Some has realized and some have not. I can tell you as a trainer and coach, not everybody has common sense. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. I know I hurt some feelings, but I'm just going to tell you here. they Some people just don't have it. They really don't. They, they want to. I think they desire to, but no, they really don't. <laughs> it's just very little. <laughs> That's why we're having this class to help with that. All right. Now, let me tell you something. Being mediocre is never enough. It's definitely not enough to make it. So if you want to compete in today's landscape, you've got to be more than mediocre. So what are you going to do differently? That's the question that I'm putting on the table today. What are you going to do differently? Okay. The CEO mindset formula equals education plus common sense. I want you to write it down somewhere. Take a picture of it. The CEO mindset formula equals education plus common sense. Put it in the chat box. The CEO mindset formula equals education plus common sense. Okay. 
Everybody got that? Okay, that's right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Trudy said, my mom said she would rather us have B's on our report cards and common sense than A's without. Hello. Tell my children that all the time. Okay. Let's start with education. You must educate yourself first to understand what you're working with. You understand? You've got to have education in order to be a CEO. I want you reading. How many books a day are you reading? How many books a week? How many of you take the time to take 15 minutes out of your day to read something that you have not read before, to learn something that you have not learned before? Tell me. Somebody said, me, I know you do. Me and you read. Like, we, I think we're having a reading competition, Trudy. <laughs> Somebody said, I read every day. Reading is imperative. What are you reading? It's so interesting because I asked um, a young lady this a while ago. I asked her, I said, um, you know, how are you feeding your, your mind? You know, are you reading? She said, yes, of course. I read every day. I said, well, what are you reading right now? Zane's new book. <laughs> I said, how is that, how is that fueling the, the, your business? Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't read nonfiction. That stuff's too serious. I just read fiction. I thought, wow. And, and where are you at now? There's nothing wrong with reading nonfiction. Or I'm sorry, fiction. But how are you feeding your brain? If you're looking to become a CEO, right? If you're looking to become a CEO, how are you enhancing yourself? How are you setting yourself up from, from the, the, the fold? How are you taking yourself from mediocre to extraordinary? Put in the box the last book you've read. I want to know the last book. Put it in the box. What's the title and when did you read it? What's the title and when did you read it? Last book. Let me see what we're working with here. Come on, CEOs. We're going from employee to CEO. Last book you've read. Hello. Put it in the box. The magic of thinking. Yes. Think and grow rich. Yes. Operations management. Yes. Who moved my cheese? Yes. If it's a podcast, what's the audio book? As a man thinketh, one of my favorite books. Reading 10X Grant Cardone. That's one of my favorite books on this planet. Just finished Motivation, Motivation Manifesto. I've got to catch that one. Top Grading. I like that book. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Somebody uh, read Rich Bitch by Nicole Lappin. Yes. 12 Years and 12 Weeks. Yes. Yes, audio counts. Audio counts. Strategic Management. The Big Book of, a of HR. The Subtle Art of Not Giving Up. <laughs> um, Lean Startup. I've read that six times. The Richest Man in Babylon. Three times. How Rich People Think. It sits on my bed step every day. The Miseducation of the Christian in 2017. Interesting. I got to catch that one. The, highly, uh, the Habits of Highly Effective People. Last week. Yes. You know, I will put a list of these books up. I surely will. Um, the Science of Getting Rich This Morning, Wisdom of Sundays Yesterday, um, Make This Year Your Best Year Last Week. Get it, Wanda. I got to just say it out. Principles by Ray Dalio. Love it. Um, the top two percent. Oh, the top two percent book. So is that the book? The Laws of Success, the 1925 Manuscript. I got to catch that one. Ooh, that's a hot one. Ooh, that's a real hot one. Let me see if anybody else is adding anything. Um, You're a badass, currently reading. The Science of Success. Book Yourself Solid. Read that six times, got an extra copy to give away. All right. I also listen to very Gary Vaynerchuk, Tony Robbins, Damon John's podcast. Yes. Okay, I see some people here. Burn the Business Plan. Deborah, I love that book. 
The Four Agreements. Oprah says you should, everyone on the planet should read that book. It's an amazing book. Hit send, get referrals. Oh, yeah. My favorite audiobook subscription service is Audible. And I am a scholar. I read so much. I listen and read so much on audio, Audible. I am a scholar. I have hit every... Um, you know, they have those little badges that you get. I, I didn't got them all. I'm waiting for them to release more. <laughs> Grant Cardone, Gary V, Tony Robbins, Les Brown, The Wealth of Nations, Claim Your Power. Uh, I'm going to tell you the books that I like. I'm going to put the camera on. I've got so many books on my bedside. It's insane here, but um, I can't see the camera here, so I don't know if you guys, I'm standing up because, yeah, I like to, yeah, I need to stretch my legs. But this one is Think Like a Billionaire, Become a Billionaire. Somebody asked me to show this book again. Please take a look. Okay. All right. I'm going to show you another one of my favorite books on this planet. Hold on is Start With Why by Simon Sinek. I read this book pretty often. <laughs> there are some books that I actually read on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Y'all know this is my library one. I've got five libraries, right? Um, another great book to read, Lateral Thinking. Okay, creativity step by step. Edward de Bono is the king of lateral thinking. If you really want to become a CEO and you want to stretch yourself in your thought process and gain some knowledge and common sense, this is a great book. All right. Um, this is a book that I read consistently The 48 Laws of Power. You got to read this book, it's going to blow your mind, actually. It's by Robert Greene. But it's an excellent book. You want to talk about raising your worth meter? Great book. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. What else do I love? There is, uh, let's just see. You know, I'm all Russell Brunson. There's another book I read all the time. And, oh, this is a book everybody should read. More Important Than Money and Entrepreneur's Team by Robert Kiyosaki. I swear, every time I go in here and read this book over and over again, I add more tabs. An amazing book to read, okay? Um, another book that I 1,000% suggest, and um, this is one of my favorite, Tribes by Seth Golden. Every person on this call and watching the replay should be reading Tribes. You understand? I read this book and listen to the audio, all right? So... And, and I'm just going to be even more transparent with you guys. Let me just show you. Hold on. Let me pull this around. Look at that. Books. I don't even have another bookshelf. This is just my office. Can you see that? I can't see what you guys can see. So these are more books down there. Then I've got other books. Y'all see that's my um, don't laugh at my towel. That's what I threw over the. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know I was going to show y'all my personal space. I threw it over right before the call. <laughs> But I want you reading consistently, consistently reading, reading, reading. When you read, you expand. All right. Watching documentaries. What's the last documentary you watched? For me, it was What the Health and I Am Not Your Guru. Tony Robbins and the other one was about your health. Cedric says the Rockefellers. That was a great a documentary. Yep, Trudy, What the Health was very good. All right. Catch a documentary. Do one once a month, once a quarter. Read something that's going to expand your mind. Watch something that's going to expand your mind. I suggest that everyone take a step at watching anime. And I'm not talking about the porn anime. I'm talking about just anime in general. When I tell you that I have learned so much as an adult watching anime, it's insane. Love it. Absolutely. Somebody's laughing at me saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're saying that. But I'm so serious. It opens your mind differently. It makes you think about things differently. This is my favorite. This is my favorite character. His name is Luffy. He sits on my desk. 
right here on the edge. So every day when I come in, I can um, see him. And he's my favorite character because you want to talk about somebody who's got heart. I mean, every time he's got adversity in front of him, he never looks at it as adversity. He looks at it as a challenge, as an opportunity to stretch, literally, because he's a gum gum guy, which means he's made of rubber. But he gives it as an opportunity to stretch himself, to expand. I have to respect that guy for that. So he is by far my favorite anime character. One Piece is the name of it. All right. Finding a coach or mentor and listening. Hello. <laughs> How many of you have a mentor or coach in your life? And then and put a one in the box. And then I want you to put a, a three in the box if you have a mentor and coach in your life that you actually listen to. <laughs> It's totally different if you got one and you don't listen to them. That's two totally different things. <laughs> Somebody put a two. They said, I don't even listen. <laughs> I don't have a coach and I don't listen. So they don't have a coach. And that's okay if you don't have a coach, but you got to find one. And it doesn't always have to be someone that you can talk to on a consistent basis. Sometimes a coach is someone who's coaching and guiding you through their YouTube videos or through their books, right? Some of you go to church, you can't get to the pastor all the time, but he's constantly guiding you, right? So understand, but you've got to find a mentor and a coach because other people have a different perspective that they can bring to you and add value. You have no clue how many people that I mentor and coach and they pay me thousands of dollars, astronomical amount of dollars and don't listen to a word that I say. It's like, why? Like, I don't get it. I'll take your money, but I really would like for you to listen. Like, I'm really trying to guide you in the right way. And then they come back and say, oh, I guess you were right. <laughs> right? So you got to listen. All right? Joining masterminds. Put a one in the box if you're a part of a mastermind. Who's in a mastermind? mastermind do you know what a mastermind is Ooh, trudy's in a good one the secret to success she says shanta's in one wanda's in one d's in one okay a mastermind it you actually in a mastermind noni you just don't realize it shante you're in a mastermind yeah um so a mastermind is when you're around a group of like-minded individuals and you have the ability to share ideas and thoughts and uh, experiences each and every one of you here are in a mastermind to some level most masterminds cost ten thousand dollars some of you are in my ten thousand dollar mastermind right so you better all have ones and for you guys you know yeah you better be in my man you know you better say yes you're in the mastermind we travel every quarter to a different exotic place and we talk about building businesses, right? So you know you're a part of that mastermind. Some of you are in some of my smaller masterminds. Anybody on this call that's in Staffingpreneurs Academy and you're in the part of the private Facebook group, the private one, you're in a smaller mastermind that I have. Yeah, when you, but it only works, right? if you interact with people and you learn and you give, right? In that case, that's exactly right. So if you're in, but if you're in the group and you're not interacting and you're not giving, then you're really not a part of the, the mastermind, right? Some of you are in a many, many mastermind for my staffingpreneurs if you are participating in the 30 day blitz challenge. That's a, a super, super mastermind. You should be putting a one in the box, right? So masterminds come in many different ways. But when you're interacting in a community of like-minded people where there's positivity, lots of times there's drinks, <laughs> you know, and sharing and eating, you know, you're in a mastermind, okay? The really good ones though, now, the, now I got to say, I've got a couple of groups. My staffingpreneurs, I feel like out of all of my communities, they have the best one. That's a real awesome virtual 
mastermind. If, if any of my staffingpreneurs are on here, I'm not talking about my other groups, but my staffingpreneurs, what do you guys think about that that uh, private inner circle group? That, that group is fire. It's always some good energy flowing through there. Always. Trudy said, awesome. Always. Like, that's my favorite mastermind. That's my absolute, well, okay, not my favorite, but my second favorite. My first favorite is the one that's associated with my personal brand, my entrepreneur mastermind, my idea grinders. I love that one too, because we get to travel. I tried to get the staffingpreneurs traveling, but I only could get Wanda and um, Renasha hardcore to be consistent to travel with me. Those are my two main travelers. I'm trying to get Tanisha to travel. If I can get a couple of core people to travel with us, then I can turn our online mastermind into something bigger. And we did go to San Juan one year. But if you're in my personal group, my idea grinders group, you guys know we go hard and we build billion dollar business models. Really, we had fun with it, right? I want to build another mastermind for my love group, but we'll have to see about that. All right, let me keep going. E-learning. Everybody on this call is in some sort of e-learning. Whether you're a, pay, a part of a paid community, whether you are in um, following Gary Vaynerchuk and he's sending you out weekly emails, right? Teaching you something, not just motivating and inspiring you, but actually teaching you something. Udemy, yep, Udemy is a great resource. Staffingpreneurs Academy is a great resource, right? Who else? What other membership communities are you in? I'm in a Kindle uh, membership e-learning. I'm in a, a songwriting e-learning. I'm in a, a Ty Lopez. I'm with, uh, I, I'd enjoy, I'm telling you, I know I'm making everybody rich. <laughs> Grant Cardone. I'm in all of that. Russell Brunts. I'm in everybody's e-learning community. Frank Kern. I love Frank Kern. I wish he wasn't married. <laughs> He just has so much swag, in my opinion. Don't tell him I said that, though. You know, Trudy's own girl, me too. I'm, I'm so, listen, that guy is so hot. Okay, okay, okay. Boyce Watkins. Okay, Percy, I love that. All right. Yes. Some You signed up with EDX. Yes. Okay. So the, these are all attributes of being, count, going from employee status to CEO status, new classes. How many of you guys are taking classes on something? Something you can't live, you can't function in a mediocre state and think you're gonna be the next billion dollar CEO. It's just not possible, right? You gotta take classes. You don't know anything about email marketing? Take a class. You know, you don't know how to use the Google Drive? Y'all know how I feel about that. Take a class. <laughs> okay. You have to empower yourself. I'm in my associate's degree in human resource management. Yes, I love it. Better yourself. I'm taking classes on social media. Yes, better yourself. Yes, Trudy, my academy is great for learning in many different ways. Yes. YouTube. Yes. Take classes on how to be an expert in Excel. Now, listen, I'm cool with that, but I really want you to give that class to your employee unless you are using it from a CEO perspective, like you're creating like those something. So we're going to talk about that over the next couple of sessions. All right. What you should be doing as a CEO. All right. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to write that note down right here. Accounting classes. Yes. You got to know how to handle your money, honey. All right. So everybody understands that education is a key part. It is core. It is the first piece in the CEO formula. Everybody got it? Put a one in the box if you got it. Put a two in the box if you just can't get it. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Almost done, guys. Almost done. All right. Question, and this is not in the poll. I might open the lines. How do I know my common sense is the wrong common sense? Does anybody want to take a stab at that, or you just want me to answer the question? How do I know my common sense is the wrong common sense? How do I know it, Dee? 
What are you saying? I thought I had common sense. Now you're, you're telling me I don't? Mm -hmm. Nobody don't want to tackle that one. Yep, that's good. <laughs> Somebody say, oh gosh, that's tricky. Somebody else say, you answer. <laughs> I'm going to say this. And I'm going, okay, somebody said when things aren't working out for you. That's a very good answer. Okay. How do I know my common sense is the wrong common sense? I like the fact that you said when things aren't working out for you, but I'm going to add to that. When you start, when you don't, when you stop, and when you start asking questions that you haven't taken the time to think through. And I'm going to tell you guys this. I love you so much. Yes, Lorraine said it. When I ask questions that I should figure out myself. I'm going to tell you this. I love each and every one of you. However, there are some of you on this call and off that don't have a lot of business common sense. And it's not a bad thing, but if you're one of those people, you know who you are. And if you answered earlier that you were a realist, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> I'm just going to say that with love. <laughs> I'm going to be nice. But what I will say is that mediocre CEOs, they don't think about things before they do them. They don't think about things before they ask. They just go. They're mediocre. They don't go far in business. They don't because they have no strategy under their belt. They don't look at things differently. If you are looking to achieve something, you're looking to figure out how to achieve something, and you're not taking time to think it through first, to jot it down, to research it, to outsource it, to something, then you understand something is fundamentally, you're, you're in a, a fundamentally challenged space at that moment in time. Does that mean you can't fix it? Of course you can fix it. But I'm here to tell you that when you start asking questions that you have not taken the time to think through before you ask the question, you're mediocre. Your skills are mediocre and you can do better. Okay? Somebody said, I have too much common sense. Too much common sense means you don't have enough. Say that with love. Okay? So let's talk about common sense. Some, for some people, common sense is inherited. Okay? It's just fundamentally inherited. How can it be inherited? Well, some of us tap into our inner spirit. Some of us understand the fact that we are not all just human bodies, but we're spiritual energy first. And when you tap into yourself from a spiritual level like that, you gain a stronger aware of intuition. When you have a stronger aware of intuition, your level of common sense grows. And it, it, that is really inherited, to be honest with you. Um, some people gain it later in life when they become even more aware of themselves. But most people, you know, you have like uh, my goddaughter, she, her mom, uh, God, you know, rest her soul was a very sick woman in the head. And so from the day my goddaughter was born, she had to have common sense in order to survive. Right. So somebody sometimes they gain common sense through trials and experiences. So I had a little bit of both. I inherited some. Then I had trials and experiences and I had to gain a lot from that way, okay? Some people gain common sense by watching others succeed and fail, right? I tell people all the time when, especially people who are starting a staffing business, I tell them all the time, you need to join the private inner circle at the minimum because you wanna get into a community where people are having trials and errors and successes so that you can prevent having those, making those same mistakes. People don't take it seriously though all the time. Sometimes people gain common sense 
through learning, which is what I'm doing now. I'm teaching you. And this is just phase one. Okay. We got three more phases minimum. I may keep adding. All right. So education plus common sense strategy. Okay. When we start talking about common sense, the core of what it is, it's the ability to be able to strategize. It's the ability to be able to look beyond what you see. Okay. When I talk about answering, uh, asking questions, if I'm going to give you a good example here, some of you will be able to work with me here. If somebody tells you that we're going to use a new platform to store data or information, let's just say that it's called the Google Drive. Okay. And You've never used this thing called the Google Drive ever in your life. Matter of fact, you don't even know what it was. You never heard of it. And when you go inside, it looks a little complicated. What do you do? Okay. Do you strategize about how to use the Google Drive? What do you do? Somebody open the lines. What do you do? I'm going to open the lines. Tell me, raise your hand. What do you do when there's a new software? Okay. Not just the Google Drive, let's take it a step further. What if you just landed a new multi-million dollar contract, but the company says you absolutely must use their the latest and greatest technology that has been launched, and they're the ones who run it and own it. And you don't know anything about it. It's got some AI, it's got some, I don't know, all types of stuff. Blockchain. What do you do? Let's say that you join a new community and there's a new class that's taking place. Okay. And, and there are things that, that you don't know. And, and people are talking about things you're not familiar with. What do you do? I, I just want to push you guys a little bit out of your comfort zone. What do you do when someone presents you with a problem in their business? Listen, we've got 50 job openings and each job opening, there is more than 600 candidates, yet we can't find the right fit. What do you do? I'm giving you all types of scenarios. What do you do? Maybe the better question is, what do you not do? Hello. Okay. Somebody says arrogance and overthinking. It can lead to arrogance and overthinking. So responses I got research and educate yourself. Network for learning. Ask a lot of questions and research and talk to people. Research and call out to my network. Hire someone to do the task. Go on YouTube to see if someone has reviews and have created a tutorial. Ding, ding, ding. That's a great one. That's what I do first all the time. Find an expert to help me run it or teach me. Research, 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 research. Google it. Google is God, whether you like it or not. It is the online God platform. If you ask a three-year-old how what something, she says, Google it. It's a verb and an adjective and a noun all in one, if that's even possible. Okay. I have to tell you, there are some people that have been in my community and when these people erased that stuff off of the Google Drive last year, I don't think I've ever been so angry in my life at my, my membership community because, and, and I was so angry and then I got angry at the people who tried to defend them. Well, maybe they just don't know how to use the Google Drive. D. That made me even angrier. When I say angry, I was so angry. There were people in the community <laughs> They wouldn't even talk on the calls for about three weeks because they knew I was still angry, still steaming. And as you can tell, I'm still steaming a year and a half later. Hello. Why am I steaming? Because it's called the Google Drive. <laughs> so if you don't know how to use it, Google it. So a lot of people who want to become CEOs are still thinking and functioning like employees, but they're walking around saying they're CEOs, 
but they're still thinking and functioning like employees and bad employees at that. Not even the good ones, because good employees do what? They Google it, they research it. So they're functioning as mediocre, crappy employees with business cards, EIN numbers, websites that probably look like crap. I'm gonna just keep it very real with you today. I'm gonna keep it very real with you today. Some of you are not ready to really run a business. Some of you need pre-CEO training. Many of you are walking around with business cards with your Gmail address on it. Hello. Many of you are signing up for applications and never taking the time to learn how to use them making rookie moves. You wouldn't even hire someone to make the types of moves that you're making. And the moment someone calls you out about it, you get in your feelings and you huff and puff and walk away. Many of you refuse to think. It's too hard. I'll just ask my coach and she'll just tell me the answer. No, I won't. And I'm going to be nasty when I tell you that because you're a CEO. You're a CEO. What have you done to try to figure it out? Tell me that first. Say, coach, I'm having an issue and this is my challenge. So this is what I'm thinking I should do. This is based on what the scenario is. This is a strategy I've come up with. And now I'm coming to you to see what your thoughts are. Am I going in the right direction or should I pull back? Don't call your coach, whether it's D. Williams. You think I could call Tony Robbins asking him how to use the Google Drive? You think Gary Vaynerchuk is going to let me get away with that? I'm just saying. <laughs> Trudy, stop teasing me. <laughs> I'm just saying, asking crazy questions that you haven't even taken the time to even, yes, Trudy, Gary will curse you out. Tony wouldn't even pick up the phone. Why do you do yourself? And why do you do your coaches that way? Wasting their time with these text messages, mediocre text messages, mediocre emails, mediocre phone calls, and having put two cents of energy into trying to figure it out yourself. Even if you don't take action on what your strategy has been, it's better for you to have strategies in place. That's going from employee to CEO. That's going from employee to CEO. What would Oprah do? What would Tony do? What would Gary do? What would D do? Okay, what would Jesus do? We can say that one too, Trudy. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Maya said, my mentor says he gets offended when folks ask him questions about him they could have found on Google. I get offended when people ask me questions that they have the answer to in their manuals, that they have the answers to in the membership community that they have the answers to in the staffing preneurs training modules or the, the, the idea grinders training modules. I get irritated when people text me crazy questions, ones that they didn't even put a cent of energy in to think the answer through and, and not say, I've got a strategy behind. Now, if you got a strategy, I'm fired up because that's what you pay me for. But if you're paying me to answer your mediocre questions, how can I take you seriously as a CEO? Because I'm a CEO. And how can I feel comfortable that if I decide to share your information with one of my Fortune 50 clients or Fortune 500 clients or Fortune 100 clients, that you're not going to go and ask them the same Questions like 
week. I'm just asking. Okay. So yeah, I'm getting a little hard because there is a such thing as a stupid question. It's the one that you don't try to figure out on your own first, that you put no energy into. You understand? Adaptation. You've got to be able to adapt to everything that's going on around you if you're going to be a CEO. Things are not always going to be on point. I have made some customers mad this week. Friday was the one of the worst days I have had in a long time. Monday, I thought it was going to get better. My team screwed up a little bit. Tuesday, we dropped the ball. Oh, I had some of my clients giving me the business. But it's how you handle it that matters at the end of the day. Whether you made the mistake, whether your team, if your team made this mistake, you got to take the loss for your team. You can go ahead and try and put it on them. That's cool. I mean, it might get you a half a cool point, but the reality is, is your business. You're the CEO. So you got to take the loss, right? And then you have to go back in and create the win. Then you go back in and create the win. You understand? This is real CEO training. Do you understand? Real CEO training. Employees point the finger and blame others and never once take responsibility. My, my philosophy is tell the truth, tell what happened, and then own up and fix it. So even if it wasn't you, you can say, my staff dropped the ball, but you know what? I'm going to fix it. I'll take care of it right now. It's what you do at the end of the day. You've got to adapt. That is common sense CEO. You've got to adapt. Somebody says CEOs are always caught holding the bag, good or bad. I'm going to tell you what frustrates me, training CEOs who are pointing the finger at someone else and, and say, oh, and look how she doing. She ain't even getting this right, but I don't see them doing anything. But that's a whole nother argument. I won't talk about that. <laughs> Objectiveness, being able to look at a scenario from many different viewpoints. Just because something is presented to you in black and white, realists, does not mean that it's black and white. Because if you look at it, if you turn it three degrees to the left, the sun hits it a little bit differently. And then there's a hint of purple that comes into play. But if you turn it a little bit to the left and the moon hits it, there might be a little bit of gray area there. So everything is presented to you, whether it's your conversation with a client, your conversation in recruiting with a candidate, whether it is a project that you're working on or implementing, whether it's a relationship that you're pursuing or that you're involved with, even down to your health, nothing on this planet is black in white 100% of the time. Common sense is having the ability to look at a situation and say, I see it in black and white. It makes sense in black and white or it doesn't make sense in black and white. But how many other ways can I look at this? One of my favorite movies of all time is called Vantage Point. If you've never seen it, watch it. It is one of the most thought provoking uh, movies you'll ever watch and it will shift your mindset. It's called Vantage Point. I think it's Kevin Costner that's in that movie. I can't remember. Okay? There's always more than one way to skin a cat. If you are looking at something and saying this is truth, please know that is not, that is, that is a very uh, linear way of thinking. That is a very linear way of thinking. Okay? Last time I checked, most truths were hypothesis which are not truths at all, <laughs> okay? So you want to be able to be objective and look at things in more than one way. Awareness, you've got to be aware of who else and what else is involved in the scenario that you are examining, that you are experiencing, okay? Now you're stepping up your game. Now you're stepping it up, stepping it up, stepping it up, stepping it up. You are shifting from that employee thought process. Because remember, employees are task-oriented for the most part. 
But CEOs, it requires you to be to think bigger, to see bigger, to strategize, to adapt, to be objective, to be aware. Okay. And you got to read between, above, below the lines. No line is the, the, the king of all lines, okay? And then you've got to be open to changing your state, right? Understanding that when you are a CEO, you're a CEO, you're a boss. That means you stand differently. You okay? I'm over here sweating, but I'm going to show y'all my boss stance. How you doing? Right? There's a guy I talked to today and I said, I want you on my podcast. And he said, mm, I don't know. You're brand new uh, and with the podcast. I said, oh, I'm not taking no for an answer. But what I will do is take a not right now for an answer. But let me explain something to you. I have 30,000 first level connections on LinkedIn, 18,000 plus on Twitter. On LinkedIn alone, I manage 11, I think I have 11 or 12 LinkedIn groups that total 500,000 members, okay? On Facebook, my personal page, I'm 200 people shy of being at my 5,000 limit, not including the fans that I have on all my collective groups and pages. The majority of my network is full of entrepreneurs in and, without, in and out of the recruitment and staffing space. You just mentioned to me that you're interested in increasing your revenue, yet you're not taking an opportunity to have free advertising, meaning we will be streamed on iTunes. We will be streamed on Google Play that has millions of listeners. So what I'm going to say to you today is I would clearly accept that you're not ready right now. But what I won't accept is the answer no. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my assistant put you back on my calendar and we can continue this conversation in two to three weeks. How does that sound? And he said, you impress me, Miss Williams. I look forward to hearing from your assistant. I said, awesomeness. I'll talk to you in a few days. I'm off to my next client. And I ended the call. Do you see how I'm standing? Do you hear my voice? Do you see my facial expression? Now, after I got off the call, I immediately had to get on another call, but it was a coaching call. So I didn't have to be hardcore CEO. So what did I do? King Caesar, come here, King Caesar. I shifted my state. Whew, I got a little bit more relaxed. I turned my wig to the side a little bit, you know. <laughs> you know, I got a little bit more comfortable. It's almost time for me to pick Lyric up. I'm light. I'm on the line with my my one-on-one -on -one client. Hey, oh my gosh. Oh, yes, yes, things are great. Finish that call and another executive I'm on the line with. Now, this one is in regards to how can we support your community? We have job orders and we need to know that the people in your community can support this. Now I'm back in a different state of mind. I'm in a different zone. I'm in a different state. I'm in boss mode. I'm not playing when I'm in boss mode. I mean business. I'm confident. I'm secure. I may be fearful on the inside because what if I say something I'm not supposed to say? But I can't focus on that because I know who I am and I know what my goal is. And when you're a boss, then you have to get into, you have to literally physically walk into that state of mind, into that state of being. And you've got to know. It's a knowing. I know who I am. I know what my goals are. I know where I'm going. You are going to know by the end of this this interaction with me. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you. You can be a boss and be cool, right? You can be a boss and be laid back, but you've got to get into that boss mode. You've got to put some depth in your voice. You've got to raise your head up a little bit higher. You want to in have voice inflection. You've got to be stern and serious. You've got to let them know that you are 100% in control. Because if you don't, they're going to sense that energy. They're going to sense that state of being. They're going to sense that state of mind. And they're going to take you, pull you, put them in, put you in their mouth, chill you up real good, spit you out, and move on till they come across somebody who they 
feel the state state of being is a feeling who they feel is worthy of their time and energy if you understand what i'm saying please put a one in the box i just want to know that you're relating to what i'm saying here anybody okay that's the state i had to i want to explain to you i really want to explain to you how it's a, it's a change in state if you've ever taken an nlp course they talk about that if you've ever listened to uh, uh abraham hicks they talk about that if you ever listen to tony robbins he talks about that it's a change of state and you have the power to step into any state you want you can step into the state of fear and intimidation you can step in a state of anger you can step into a state of confidence surety you have the power to be in any type of state that you want and for the 38 percent or whatever that percentage number was of the people who had a fear of poverty you actually have the ability to step into a state of abundance hello hello so everything that i'm teaching you tonight about going from employee to ceo it really does core down to it will boil down to your change of state your your ability to strategize to look at something and say okay let me let me look at this from many different vantage points before i speak before i type before i present my thought process right um to adapt into situations sometimes people are going to be nasty I can only imagine working with Steve Jobs and him talking to me like he's a prick, but I value his knowledge. So what do I do? I adapt. Do I go back and I'm nasty? No, but I adapt because I want what he has to give me right now, as long as I can get it because I know I'm going to get something from it. Charlemagne the God talked about how a crazy Wendy, Wendy Williams and her husband was at the radio show, but how he stayed because it was they were giving him something. They weren't paying him a dollar while he was there, but they were giving him knowledge and experience. So he stuck it out so that he could gain that. He adapted. Even when it was uncomfortable, he adapted, which is why he's at a, a, a level of success, whether we like him or not. Right. OK. I'm just I'm going to show you all that. All right. Good. All right. Hello. Hello. Somebody said, this is what I really need to work on, right? I've been told my whole life, I'm too nice, no more. You can be nice, but you have to have, you, 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 it's, it's okay to step into a state of strength. You can be nice and have strength. I'm nice 98% of the time, right? 98% of the time, I'm extremely nice, but I'm still in a state of CEO. 2%, I'm a straight B-I-T-C-H. And no nonsense one at that. You can ask my staff. If somebody on my staff is not working properly, oh, they get the blues. If my clients aren't happy and they screwed up and I had to take the brunt, I give them the blues. And I fire quick. Because if you're not down for the cause, if you're not here to impact my clients' lives in a positive way, then you have no space in my business. So I don't play. So a lot of us here are playing CEO. We're wasting our money, spending our money, not willing to shift who we truly are so that we can be in the role that we wanna be. You think Beyonce got this far by being weak? I get teased a lot because they say I'm strong, I'm hard. Do you think that I'm in the state that I am? because I'm weak? No, I know what I want. I go after what I want. I want you guys to be a CEO. I want you guys to know what you want. I want you to go after it. Does it mean you have to be mean? No. Does it mean you have to be confident? 100%. Does it mean you have to live in faith? Yes, beyond faith, knowing. You've got to know, you've got to know, you've got to know. You have to turn your fear into a no. You've got to turn your fears into a knowing. I know that this is for me. Stop falling in love with things that, that don't benefit you and fall in love with the things that will take you to where you want to be. Bring it on. Hello. 
All right, last thing, I swear, this is like less than 10 minutes. I knew I was gonna be here. CEO basics, ready to become a CEO? I didn't even do it. Pay attention, okay? We're gonna go through this over the next month. When we do our next one, it's gonna be more workshop focused. Pay attention to things that are going on around you. Pay attention, okay? Somebody put in a group today, I'm not gonna call them out. They asked a very weird question. What's the name of the group we're in? I was like, what? <laughs> CEO questions here only. And I said it outwardly purposefully. Pay attention. Don't ask crazy questions. Only ask questions that are CEO worthy. Okay? Time is money. Put a dollar on it. I have a nice chapter about that in my book. Move fast enough to take action, but slow enough to build the foundation of your business. It is a rookie move to start a business and that you're moving so fast that the foundation crumbles right up underneath you because you're trying to get money or trying to get, you know, I don't know what you're trying to get when you don't, you can't even move into a house without a foundation. So why are you trying to start a business without one? Why are you skipping the, the core training? Why are you skipping the core things that are needed for your business to grow? If you don't have the money to start the business, don't start it. Start somewhere else. Start a smaller business. Make that fuel, you know, let that fuel you, the business that you want to start. You understand? The, big, the bigger your goals, the more help you're going to need in reaching them. I've learned this the hard way in my career. I was a lot like Tanisha, I'm a control freak. I wanna do everything myself. It wasn't until I hired a staff that I realized I was doing 80 different jobs by myself and it was hurting me down to the core. You've got, if your dreams are big, you gotta outsource or you've gotta hire. You've gotta do one of the two. If you got small little baby dreams, then stick in it. But if you've got big dreams, you wanna bring them to life, you need a team that's gonna back you up and support you. And just sidebar, Love on your team. You won't have the business without the team. Love on them. Hire people that you can love on and support and grow, okay? Only ask the smart questions, not the dumb ones that devalue your worth. If you're asking your coach and your colleagues dumb questions, you're definitely gonna ask your, your client and they are definitely gonna give you the side eye and they're definitely gonna decide to use somebody else who uses their brain or at least has enough common sense to create strategies. I shouldn't have to even say these things, okay? Dress and feel how you want people to perceive you. Put on a suit, put on a dress, get yourself together. Make sure your nails aren't outlandish. Ladies, I know that it's cool to have 10 inch nails, but it's really not cool. Cause I'm telling you, when I sit in a boardroom, the, the, one of the things, it, it really irritates me but the, the thing that, that these people say, I'm going to just tell you, the, on the last meeting I was in, it was actually this week, and one of the ladies, this, I can't even, I can't name the company, but she's a very high-end lady. You guys actually probably see her a lot on TV, okay, businesswoman, and she made a comment about a lady who came in, and she said, how does she wipe her ass with those 10-inch nails? And she was talking about a sister. I was so embarrassed. She wasn't asking me per se. She was just actually having cordial conversation with other board members. It just so happens that I was the only one that looked like the sister who had the 10 inch nails. So, you know, clearly everybody was scooting their little eyes at me. <laughs> it's like, I don't even have nails, okay? So don't even don't be looking over here. But the point is, it's not cute. Not if you're a CEO walking in the boardroom. It's not cute. Fix yourself. No, cut those nails down. Tone the color down. People are going to see you in the manner in which you perceive yourself. So dress and feel how you want to be perceived. And then finally, create standards for yourself and your business. Don't accept everything. You should have standards around the way. I have one staffing preneur, they, they are obsessed with their website, husband and wife duo. I wanna get mad sometimes, but I can't because they have something that I am so thankful that they have because a lot of people do not have this and that is standards. 
So I, I can't do anything but high five them on the side. Like, yes, you get on my nerves, but yes, do it. Check me again. For real. You got to have standards for yourself and for your business. You understand? You got to have self, you got to have standards for yourself and for your business. I have another staffingpreneur in particular that wanted to go out and do all of these things and their website was mediocre, horrible to be honest. No standards. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Nobody's going to be looking at it anyway. No, that's not true. Stop it. Please create some standards around yourself. You understand? So these are things that will help transition you from being an employee to a CEO. For some of you, you may not like everything I had to say. That's cool. You know, send me an email, let me know, and we'll put it in the next training. All right. What I am going to do, that's the final slide here, right? So I'm closing out. But what we are going to do is prepare for phase two, where we have a workshop. We'll have a special guest on. We're going to talk about more foundational things that are involved with being a CEO, right? We're going to talk about processes and systems and maybe a tiny bit of just more key fundamental things that you need to know as you are moving along in your entrepreneurial journey. At some point, this will be the class that I give people before they go into one of my higher end mastermind groups or training courses, because some people need pre CEO courses. Do you understand? Some people need that. So, um, Kevin, OK, let me I'll um, give me 10 minutes after we get off and then go back again. OK, so. And, and so, yes, so we'll oh, we'll keep, I think the coupon is good until the 22nd at midnight, all right? So if it's not working, that means that somebody cut it off. <laughs> I'll turn it back on so you can go back. And of course, of course, all right? I hope this webinar was good for you. Put a one in the box if you are fired up about going from employee to CEO, yeah! Yes. <laughs> yes, the next one, I think it's the 22nd of March. I think, I hope not. I, well, I got to look at my calendar and make sure because I'll be in Florida one week. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. I love each and every one of you guys. I will see you in the next event. I may change the date if my assistant put the wrong date on. I'll be in Florida the week of the 22nd in Orlando. Um, but uh, we will be in touch. I love each and every one of you, and I'll see you at the next session. Thank you so much. This will be on YouTube. I really want to empower and impact the world. So I don't even know if it'll be private. It may be open for the public. So you guys will get a link so you can go back and watch the replay if you need it. March 28th, that's perfect. All right. Thank you so much. I love you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Y'all have a great night. Bye. <laughs>